Seeing Chi acting shamelessly loving around Nam in front of Ronnie when she knew all the truth even irked her more. Can't underestimate this snake. What is she scheming? I'd better watch out on her. Later that day, while working near the kitchen, Veronica spotted Chi doing something fishy. Hey, what you doing? Nothing. Veronica immediately bent down to see a wrinkled food package in a bin nearby. What? The expiration date was 2023, a year ago? Hey, why do we still have expired food here? Oh gosh, but is it ice cream that room 302 asked for? Right away, Ronnie asked the staff to check all of the food orders and rushed after the food trolley which was set to arrive at room 302. The news was soon to reach Nam, so he sprinted to the guest's room to see Ronnie was already there. Excuse me, miss. On behalf of the hotel, I do apologize for this inconvenience. It's on us for not training our staff well. I'll be talking to her now. Then he dragged Ronnie into the corner. You're ruining others' efforts due to your irresponsibility, don't you see? If you can't do it properly, then do nothing! His words were like thousands of daggers pierced into Ronnie's heart. Okay, now I got it. In his eyes, I was only that. Shallow. Suddenly, the guests came near them. Excuse me, I know you're teaching your staff and it's not my business to interfere, but this girl wasn't the one who delivered the food earlier. But she came here and sincerely apologized to me for what she didn't do, which is much appreciated. You should reward her instead. Hearing that, Ronnie couldn't hold her tears and ran away. Ronnie! Veronica! Sorry, I gotta go. Our manager will talk with you soon, and the hotel will offer some compensation for your trouble. Gosh, my anger got the better of me, and I hurt her once again. Where are you, Ronnie? I was too dumb to keep chasing after him like a fool, while well, he didn't bother to care, and even wanted to kick me out. Okay, fine. I'll go as you wish. In the blurred vision due to teary eyes, Ronnie spotted a smirk face of Chi, the one who's behind all of this. If it hadn't been for my brother and two families, I would expose you already, you snake! That night, Ronnie didn't want to face Nam at the hotel, so she ran to Hoi River for some fresh air, and in front of her eyes was Hoi An with a different charm. At night, when the dark covered everything, colorful lanterns were lit up, stretching the sparkling lights in every corner of the ancient town. But the splendid view didn't color her any happier. She was glumly dragging her feet on the sidewalk when she spotted an old woman sitting on the edge of a riverbank selling floating lanterns, and her hands were shaking when she was trying to light them up. Let. Me. Help. You. Okay? Then she sat down and helped her kindle the candles and deliver lanterns to buyers. Seeing their faces beaming with the flickering candle lights made Ronnie unconsciously smile. It's like everyone whistles their dreams in lanterns and has the river give wings to the wishes to fly high and far away. Ronnie was immersed in her own thoughts when she accidentally burned herself. Are you okay? What? Ronnie, listen, I came to apologize to you for the misunderstanding this afternoon. I should have listened to you first. Let me help you. Don't frown like that, or you're gonna be some wrinkled old woman soon. Hey, hello, Earth to Veronica. All right, let me show you around. We only have tomorrow here before returning to Da Nang. You will regret it if you don't go. Come on, I beg you, okay? Veronica was still in a foul mood, but unknowingly stretched her hand. They said goodbye to the old lady and walked side by side along Hoi River, but no one said anything until, Are you gonna ignore me forever like that? You think I'm some annoying girl, don't you? Huh? Why you ask that? Um, no, maybe. Then why you had to hire a fake girlfriend just to avoid me? What? She knew it? But how? I, I, I'm sorry. It was the reason at first, but it turns out I was wrong about you. You have a good heart and don't deserve those things. Maybe it's too late, but I'm sorry again. I should have thought it through first. What makes you think of me like that? It's like years ago. You suddenly slammed a door in front of me without a word and then now turned indifferent and hateful to me. Why, Nom? Something happened, and I'll tell you when time feels right. Please trust me. I never hate you and will never. Please tell me, what should I do for you to forgive me? I don't know, but maybe... Ah, uh, Padalo. Or here they call it Dap V, right? Yes, I want to try Dap V, but we're not done here. Okay, okay. The next day, Nam took Ronnie to Padalo as promised. Okay, Dap is riding, V is the duck. But wait, it's clearly a swan. Why? Um, I don't know either. Vietnamese is complicated. <laughs> Having tickets, two of them were waiting to be on boat, and Veronica couldn't hide her excitement. Okay, be careful! It's flippable! Poof! I'm not a kid! Then Ronnie excitedly jumped on the boat, causing it to sway from side to side, and it wobbled even more as she was being extremely panicked. Ah! I haven't watched!
watch Stranger Things Season 5 yet? I can't die now! Nom, save me! <laughs> I told you what? Now, take my hand. Ronnie slowly held out her hand, then Nom gently pulled her in his arms and helped her sit down. Do you feel okay now? No, I'm not okay at all. Hey, aren't you saying you want to do Padalo? Here you go. Ah, that's right. Then they left the dock and started pedaling farther. Ronnie at first had some troubles in steering the boat, but with the help of Nom, she totally enjoyed this little game. It's just like riding a bike. Simple, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of an exercise, right? Then exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, they even raced against each other enthusiastically and went to the middle of the lake without knowing. Hey, why suddenly stop? <sighs> I feel my legs are gonna leave me soon. Then suddenly, rain started pouring down and the boat started tottering. They looked around to find that the other boats had already returned to the dock, leaving theirs alone here. Oh my god, we had to pedal fast to the dock now! Hey, together! One, two, one, two. But the strong wind made the boat even more wobbly. Just wait here until the rain stops. What? I couldn't just wait here! Anyone? Help! Help! But Ronnie's attempt clearly turned in vain, as it only invited more people on the shore taking pictures and recording them. After a while, everything was quiet before Nom broke the silence. Do you still recall that day back in secondary school? We snuck outside to buy a new flavor of our favorite bubble tea. It was raining hard, just like today. <laughs> you still remember that? Right, that day we were soaked like rats, just to be chased by a dog, and we ended up dropping bubble teas on the road, and even got scolded by teachers. <laughs> <laughs> then the two of them kept talking about the good old moments together, without noticing the rain had abated since when. Soon after, the safeguard appeared to help them return to the dock. About Ronnie and Nam, they might get wet, but more than that, they were soaked in the fresh emotions towards each other. Nom, let's call today Duck Day. And on this day, June 6th, every year, we're gonna do Padalo again. Sounds fun. That night, someone uploaded photos of them on the lake on the internet. It naturally became the meme of the day and received thousands of reactions. <laughs> Those comments are so funny. Nom, you read it? But not as funny as your face. Then every night after, they kept texting each other, and it was always dawn when they finally said goodnight. Is it too early to think about our firstborn child's name? <laughs> no way Nom would do anything to harm my family. But what should I do to convince Grayson? I've been wrong about her all the time. It was stupid of me to project my hatred towards her mom to her. Seeing this, Grayson and Chi surely didn't take it well. Bay, what are we supposed to do now? Urgh. Just one more step away. Early the next morning, Grayson met Ronnie for some negotiation. My baby sis, our plan needs your little help to be kicked off. No way I help you. Stop your silly crush. Do you really dare to betray your own family just for some jerk? Says you, I give you one week to find evidence and now what you've got? Nothing, apart from some dirty tricks you pulled on Nom. Tell you what, I'm out. Grayson, what now? We don't need her, I have another plan. A few days later, Nam's hotel suddenly got back out at night. But it wasn't the only thing out of his expectation. Call technicals to check the grid now! Hey you! Your boss here, right? Yes ma'am, I apologize for the accident. It might just be some minor technical problems. Please come back to your room. The electricity will soon return. Patient? How could I be patient when your staff humiliated me? W what ma'am? Everything's turned pitch black and I was trying to find some receptionist. Here you are. Why cut the electricity without notice, huh? Please bring me a fan or something. I'm sweating like crazy. You're sweating not for being hot, but for you being overweight, miss. You're saying what? Are you deaf? I'm saying because you're fat, miss. So this is the way you train your staff? Right then, more and more customers came to confront Nom. Hey, some staff snuck into my room saying to fix some wire plugs, but he stole my wallet away. Me too. My laptop was stolen when the lights were out as well. Hotel what? It's a scam, guys. Nom was trying to calm the guests down, but they seemed not to be in a mood for any explanations. Instead, they asked to return the room and demanded a payback. How... How could this happen? Little did he know, the mastermind was already sneakily slipping through the crowd to run away. That's it. And now let's see how that jerk deals with this. 
Nam tried to track down the staff, but he was nowhere to be seen. The hotel was plunged into turmoil. Orders came in few, and the reputation was seriously in ruin. Ronnie couldn't bear seeing that. It's definitely Grayson who's behind all of this. He's my brother, but he's wrong this time. Even if it's true Nam wanted to harm our family, there's many other ways to confront this. And she meant it. She came straight to find Grayson. It's you, right? What are you talking about? Don't act innocent. It's you who set up the Nam's hotel incident. Yes, it's me. So what? This little brat has no skills in running business anyway. I just helped him realize it sooner. You have to admit this and return the prestige to Nam's hotel. Huh? Are you dreaming, my little sis? Oh no, my big bro. I'm sorry to tell you that actually, I've already recorded our conversation. If you have no guts to admit, then let your little sis do it. I, hey, I don't know anything about this. Don't drag me into this. Bye! W why do you do this? I'm your brother! That's why I want you to understand we couldn't take revenge by revenge. Jesus, did that jerk cast a spell on you or what? Why now you still blindly trust him? It's him who made our resorts stumble. Then Nam out of the blue barged in. Who told you I harmed your family? Here you are. If not you, then who else? Isn't it you who did this to take revenge for... Keep talking. Why stop? Take revenge for what? I've already turned a blind eye and let this slide. And now you want to dig this up? Okay, fine. That's when Ronnie knew all the truth about her mom scheming on taking Nam's family's resort for her own possession. That's also the reason why that day he coldly left her without a word. N my mom? So my dad was also in on that? No, your dad is totally oblivious about that. Mr. Andrews was so kind to help us with a handsome sum to start again. He's been so nice to us, so I don't want to make a fuss. And you've known about this the whole time, but still talk about revenging? Don't you see our family as the one who should take the blame? Grayson, it's the karma we have to take. I'm so disappointed in you and mom. No, I'm, I do apologize to you for all the troubles my family has caused you and your family. I will handle this ASAP. Then Veronica asked Grayson to publicly admit his scheme and apologize to Nam. This wasn't easy for Grayson, but I know deep down, my brother isn't a bad person. Thanks to that, Nam's hotel resumed working smoothly as before. After that, Ronnie and her brother came back to the States and told the truth to their dad. What? You've been doing this behind my back the whole time? You know what? We're more brothers to each other. When I had nothing, it's him who helped to lift me up, and now you were quite evil with good? Mrs. Andrews was perplexed, as this was the first time she saw her husband this mad. She admitted her wrongdoings, and a few days later suggested they come back to Vietnam to apologize to Nam's family. And of course, they couldn't believe in what they were just told. They kept silent for a while, then... To be honest, this news is totally strange to me. But it's all the past now. Let's end here once and for all. And after everything, the siblings finally found themselves on the same side in the matter. I was about to tell you before, but not until now do I have courage. But thank you, Ronnie. You might not believe it. If it hadn't been you and the recording, I might not have been able to awake from the nightmare of revenge and then admit my wrongdoings. I was foolish to let hatred and jealousy cloud my judgments and act silly. But thanks to Nam's big heart and your righteousness, I now learn my own lessons. And hey, he might be a good brother-in-law, sis. How could it happen when our families and me alone caused too many troubles to his family and him? Two years later, now Veronica's worked for her family business as Grayson's assistant. One day, when going back to home after a tiring working day, she got a message from a strange number. What's this? This is creepy. Anyways, today is June 6th, so what? Oh my, is it... Veronica hurriedly outside to see Nam already there, holding a big bouquet. Ready? Hmm, ready. Why you suddenly... Oh no. See, what takes you so long? Oh, pardon me, princess. It's hard to find a pedalo, uh, a true Dap V in the States. Bonjour. I'm Chloe, and I live here in the French city of Toulouse. I'm working on my debut romance novel about a couple destined to be together despite all the hurdles they face. If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment. Boo! <laughs> Lost in your dumb fictional world again? If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment. <laughs> That's Cedric, my brother. But I doubt it, because we have nothing in common. And he's a massive pain in my... Uh -huh. Anyway... 
I guess you could say I'm introverted, and I dream of becoming a best-selling romance novelist, making a living out of doing what I love. Only, dreams don't always go to plan, and publishing houses don't seem to like my drafts. Meanwhile, Cedric is Satan in disguise, whose sole purpose is making my life miserable. He turned off my alarm and made me late for a meeting, changed all of my contacts' names to emojis, and one time, I woke up to see my laptop covered all in plastic wrap. The problem was, he got away with being a jerk simply because he was deemed good-looking. In his fangirl's eyes, he could do no wrong. Living with Cedric was such an endurance test, so I avoided him the best I could by going to a private school, instead of the same public school as him. Everything was fine, until our parents lost everything in stocks, and we had no choice but to move into this teeny, tiny house. One night, I went downstairs to get some water and saw Mom and Dad up late with bills piled up around them. Seeing them like that made me desperately want to help. So the next day, I told them that the public school had a creative writing club and that I wanted to transfer there. My tuition fees weren't a burden anymore, but going to the same school as Cedric was not ideal. So I insisted that he acted like he didn't know me at all. Still, the first few days were terrible as I kept getting lost and felt so out of place. I hardly looked up and only identified other students by their shoes. Thank goodness for the pink and white sneaker girl, Emma. She was the only person who actually noticed me, and when I told her about my writing dreams, she was really supportive. We became best friends and could chat about everything, even my annoying brother. Things were better at school, but not at home. My parents were still struggling to hide their money problems and Cedric... Well, was just being Cedric. Couldn't he see that now wasn't the time for his clown antics? I helped out as much as I could by cleaning, doing laundry, preparing meals, and even got a part-time job in a patisserie. While he literally did nothing. Why can't you stop fooling around? Chill out, sis. Even when you have a mare, all the stress will give you gray hair. Fine, act like a moron and stay in this moronic place forever. I'll get our old house back alone. After a busy shift, I just wanted to get home and go straight to bed. Only when walking along the curb, I spotted Cedric doing some dumb, noisy performance. Ugh, such a laughable, selfish bum. I had to seriously hold back or else my fist would definitely land on his face. Oh, I still had the last chapter to finish. My body was ready to shut down, but I couldn't slack. Not if I wanted to complete it by Louis Beaumont's book launch. He's my favorite author. I'd planned for months to fly to Nice and hand him my manuscript. Suddenly, the lights went out. Guys, looks like the electricity company cut us off because of those unpaid bills. Gosh, we can't live like this. So I pulled out some money from the back of the manuscript. This was money for my Nice trip. But this is more urgent. So I gotta do what I have to do. Mom, Dad, here's some money. Just to help out a bit. The next day, Cedric barged into my room with a smug grin on his face. Guess who's going to Paris? Try not to miss me too much, will ya? What? B but where do you get your money from? Mom and Dad? Duh. Check it out. That's my money? I can't believe this. We don't even have electricity, but they gave him money to go mess around in Paris? I shoved him out of my room and slammed the door shut. I'd always tried my best to not disappoint them, yet they favored my deadbeat brother and spoiled him rotten. All this family stuff was eating me up, so on school day, I confided in Emma. Only when I tried talking to her, she seemed distracted and kept drifting with the music. Em, Em, are you listening? Oh, sorry, but this beat is straight up fire. Look, he's the winner of this contest. Isn't he amazing and talented? I looked at her phone and saw, what? Cedric? So he came to Paris for this stupid contest? Don't talk about him, okay? That's my selfish, uncaring brother I've always talked about. Be his fan, and we can't be friends anymore. Things got even worse when Cedric went home and literally made it rain with his reward money. Chloe, look at all of this money your brother won. Thanks to his talent, we can go back to our old house. Ugh, why is everything so easy for Cedric? He did some nonsense rap and became a celebrity? Meanwhile, it's me who had to give up my trip, my dream. At least we got the old house back, but day after day, these annoying reporters are driving me crazy. How did you come up with meaningful lyrics? Meaningful? Everyone knows rap isn't actually music. It's just some noise full of swearing and insults. Yeah, ignore her. She's just cranky from skipping breakfast. There's no escaping Cedric's name, not even at school. Please, please, please introduce me to him. Why are you so obsessed with him? Don't you remember anything I said about how terrible he is? Come on, give his music a try. I can't believe someone who wrote such beautiful lyrics can be as bad as you say he is. 
Fine. If she wanted to meet him, then I'd grant her that wish. It's about time she saw his true face. I opened the door and showed Emma inside when suddenly we were covered in a cloud of confetti. Why the long face? My grand welcome was the bomb. Do you know how long it would take to clean this mess? Ugh, Em, this is my brother. An idiot. Idiot brother. Em. But then I turned around to see Emma already soaking up Cedric's every word. I can't take this anymore. My time would be better spent writing. Trembling thoughts. Through fear, your eyes will find mine. Love will bind us like a cat's nine lives. Wow, that's perfect. Wait, that voice sounds unfamiliar. Oh my, this guy was heartthrob level handsome. Bonjour, I'm Pierre, Cedric's colleague. Is he home? Yes, let me show you the way. What are you seeking him for? We're collaborating on my next album, so I'm here to practice. As a senior singer, I also helped Cedric build his show and industry connections. He's superb, isn't he? After that day, Pierre visited my house more often. Turns out he's a sweet and gentle guy who always brought us gifts, such as flowers and scented candles. And after dinner, he even helped me wash up. How can such an angel work with my devil brother? One day when I was out with Emma, suddenly she looped her arm around me and said, You sure seem chirper these days. It's probably because Cedric's off and away on music shows. You're telling me it has nothing to do with Pierre? Come on, Chloe, it's written all over your face. Fine. He's really sweet, and his smile is as bright as the sun. How can I approach someone like him? Hmm, why not start with a love letter? I took Emma's advice and wrote the most romantic letter ever, then brought it to his company. If anyone asks, I'll say I'm here to see my brother. Huh? Are they arguing? I went over to Pierre and asked him what had happened. Oh, it's nothing really. Cedric is just stressed out from his busy schedule. Yeah, right. As if there was anything stressful about this nonsense rap thing. Now is my moment. So I stuffed the letter in Pierre's hand, then ran away. I was still giddy with excitement when I arrived home. Only Cedric ruined my mood by sitting there looking like he'd swallowed a wasp. Oh no, are all showbiz parties too tiring? What a tragedy. Shut it, Chloe. What does a dreamer like you know? Dreamer? At least I'm not a self-centered, shallow idiot. I sacrificed everything so you could go after your dumb rap career. And all you do is act like an ungrateful jerk. Grow up and stop being so childish. I expected him to shout back at me, but instead he gave me this dead look, then trudged off to his room. He didn't come down for dinner or anything for the next three days. Hmm, this house sure was quiet without him. But he's a chill guy and things will go back to normal soon, right? I guess I should just enjoy the peace while I could. The next day, Emma showed up at my house all worked up. Is Cedric here? He didn't answer any texts and calls. Huh? You two are messaging each other? Uh, um, I just wonder if he's okay. How typical of you to talk to him behind my back. To my surprise, Emma just impatiently barred past me and ran up to Cedric's room. Then she reappeared with a note. Cedric's gone. Jeez, how irresponsible and impulsive. He really doesn't care about anyone but himself. Enough! I won't listen to you badmouth your brother anymore. Can't you see he's seriously struggling and showing signs of depression? Who's the one who doesn't care about family here? And you really believe you're better than him? Emma's outburst left me stunned. Is Cedric really depressed? How was I meant to know that when he's always goofing around? That evening, mom and dad kept fretting about Cedric's disappearance. He gave us all to help us while we could do nothing to help him. Remember those days he performed on the streets? He gave us all the money he earned, and he always tried to cheer us up when things were down. Cedric only wanted to join the rap contest to win some more money. He was very nervous, but we believed in him, so we gave him the money to enter. Oh God, so I misunderstood him all along? Suddenly I remembered his winning track that Emma insisted that I listen to. I went up to my room and turned it on. It's about us. His beloved family. Turns out he wasn't a deadbeat idol loser like I thought he was. He always puts on a happy face to lift other spirits while quietly struggling with his own demons. I needed to find him and apologize immediately. So I went to Pierre for help. I had no idea he was struggling so badly. I should have noticed that he was suffering and not overloaded him with work. But there's an important show coming. If Cedric was a no-show, he'd be in breach of his contract and have to pay a huge sum in compensation. Oh no, that's not good. What should we do now? You know what? You look a lot like Cedric. How about you disguise as him? But how? Don't worry, our makeup team is top-notch. Nobody's gonna know. 
This all sounded crazy, but it seemed like I had no other choice. My family couldn't be in debt again for this. Being this close to Pierre made my heart flutter. He took me for my makeover, then I learned to lip sync and perform on stage. I even tried to walk and talk like my brother. I felt bad about deceiving his fans, but I couldn't risk Cedric getting into big trouble. It's only a one-time thing. Sometimes I lip sync too. It's no big deal. I felt a bit confused. Then suddenly, a stage crew member above me accidentally dropped a wrench. It could have knocked me off if Pierre didn't swoop in and save the day. Now, back to practicing, and oh boy, was it hectic. Pierre stayed with me the whole time and was really supportive. We also never stopped trying to look for Cedric together. I felt our connection growing, but couldn't figure out why he hadn't made any move. Maybe my first letter hadn't been clear enough, so I sneaked into Pierre's room and left him another one. Only later that day, I saw him glued to his phone, so I took a glance. Huh? He was messaging somebody with a very cheesy nickname. Right, he wasn't interested because he was already dating someone else. Oh no, I have to reclaim my second letter before humiliating myself. I ran into his room but couldn't find it anywhere. Wait, what's this? Here comes the big night. I was absolutely terrified. Pierre smiled sweetly at me and held my hands. We shared a look, then stepped on stage together. There were so many people out there. My legs felt numb, but then I spotted Emma beaming at me from the front row, and my nerves eased again. I quickly found the beat, then lip-synced and danced perfectly. But halfway through the song, the stage light suddenly went off and a shadowy figure walked toward me. Cedric! The audience oohed and awed, then clapped in excitement as Cedric continued the rest of the performance. During the break, everyone went backstage and saw Pierre grab Cedric's arm. Cedric, where have you been? We've all been worried sick. Drop the act. You're just using me to make yourself rich, forcing me to do show after show, and when I was exhausted, you pushed lip syncing onto me. What are you talking about? These shows are to help you gain support. Starting out in this industry is hard. Hey, I even lent you some money to get your house back. You mean the money you used to tie my brother in with a stupid contract? You compelled Cedric to work exclusively with you, performing two years for free to clear his debt. But according to these receipts for each show, the money he should have received already exceeded the amount he owed you. W what the? Surprised much? Now we have all the evidence against you. So what? Cedric signed it anyway. A contract is a contract. Break it and I'll get you kicked out of the company and make sure you never get any show again. Your whole family will be dirt poor alike before. I don't think so. What would the public say if they knew you've been flirting with him all along, and when he rejected you, you manipulated and overworked him until he agreed to date you? Uh, how long have you known? Long enough to expose you. Now, you have two options. One, cancel the contract within the next 24 hours and pay my brother the access money you exploited from him. Or two, we'll publish what you did and see if you survive in showbiz afterward. I don't hate you for having feelings for me, but this deal is not fair. Pierre looked nervous and angry, then just stormed off. I turned to my annoying, goofy brother and gave him a big hug. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you before. Why didn't you tell us that you borrowed money to get back our house? I know how much you wanted our house back, so I joined the contest, but the prize money wasn't enough. That's when I asked Pierre. Silly me. If you hadn't found the contract and receipts, I would have still believed his lies and worked till exhaustion. So you did get my message. I was about to shut off all connections to the world. But that day I felt super uneasy, so I opened my phone and saw your message. Must be sibling telepathy. One more thing. Emma, you truly helped me find myself again. What do you say? Do you want to be a superstar rapper's girlfriend? Yes, I do. Please keep the lovey-dovey stuff to a minimum in front of me. Luckily, I was spared when a stage crew called Cedric to go back on stage. You know, it's not easy for us artists to have a big platform, literally like the stage. We always have a price to pay for the glory. Because of that, I'm eternally grateful for my amazing family and friends who always have my back. And a big shout out to my sister for being my inspiration for this song. Then he started rapping to my poetry. His rhymes and my poems are flowing, really getting the crowd going. He's a lyrical gymnastic genius. After the show, Cedric received a video from Pierre. Cedric, I'm sorry for taking advantage of you. I like you so much and wanted to keep you close. I'll pay back what I owe you, then take a break from showbiz for a while. I really hope one day you can forgive me. 
Phew, all that drama was a lot for my introverted self to handle. So now, I've treated myself to some me time to recharge. Thanks to Cedric rapping, dozens of my publishers reached out to me for my poems, including those who'd previously rejected me. <sighs> Gosh, am I seeing it wrong? A male from Louis Beaumont himself? I can't wait to see him in person. And you keep working on your dream. Perhaps a secret angel is on the way to bring you a wonderful opportunity. Hmm. I wonder what's taking Valerie so long. She's been in that changing room for ages. Valerie, is everything okay in there? Don't force it if it doesn't fit. No, this is the last dress in store. I just need to breathe in for a bit longer. So? It's beautiful, isn't it? Valerie spun around. Then suddenly... Yep. Trying to squeeze into a dress two sizes too small for her, then it split. <sighs> the giggles around us started. Valerie blushed, hurriedly paid for the dress, and pulled me out of the shop. Why am I so fat? Ugh! I just want to feel pretty on my date. If I was skinny like you, I wouldn't have this problem. Poof! You know, it's not as easy as you think being thin. Yep, you heard me right. Being thin has its downsides. First of all, fashion. My nightmare. I have to wear an extra small size, and the clothes still hang off me. Actually, most of my clothes are from kids' stores, so I feel so untrendy. Then in winter, I have to wear tons of layers just so I don't freeze to death. And in the summer... I can't wear cute clothes as I look like a coat hanger. Not only that, because I'm so skinny, people often ask me to do nonsense stuff. Once, I was studying in my room when suddenly I heard my sister Camilla calling me. She'd forgotten her keys and forced me to climb through her tiny window gap to get them. Seriously, I can't even... Then, on another occasion, Valerie made me crawl into the classroom locker to help her cheat on her Spanish test. Unfortunately, the teacher walked in while this was happening and gave me a week's worth of detentions, of course. Ugh! Oh my god, No Way Home is so good. I literally can't think of one bad thing to say about it. Yep, the part near the end? Ah! Yep, guess what? I'd managed to trap my foot in a manhole. Man, what rotten luck. I tried pulling my leg free, but it was no use. It wouldn't budge. There I was, freaking out that I'd be stuck here forever, and all my friends could do was huddle together and ask me questions like, Madeline, how on earth did you get your foot in such a small slot? Wow, that's unbelievable. Even Jaden, my bookworm friend, took out a ruler from his backpack and started measuring how wide the slot was. Grr. My dear friends, I'm being stuck down here. Stop gopping and help me! Finally, they tried helping me out, but in the end, we had to call the rescue squad. By this point, a massive crowd had gathered around me and strangers were filming me. When I was finally free, everyone looked at me and held back their laughter. Even Parker, my crush, was smiling. Jeez, this was beyond embarrassing. But a hot guy like Parker would never notice a moving skeleton like me anyway. <sighs> Don't think like that, Maddie. You're so pretty. Show me some confidence, would you? Valerie said as she nudged my arm. I put the book down and glared at her, and suddenly noticed Parker walking towards our table smiling. And, yep, he said he wanted to sit with us. Even though I was cheering inside of my head, I still had to act composed. And, oh my god, can you believe he even said I was cute? After that day, Valerie kept on encouraging me, saying he had definitely given me a green light. So, finally, I gathered my courage to write down all my feelings for Parker on a note and clipped it to his notebook. At the end of class that day, 
he came to my desk and took my hand. Yay! Everything was fine, great even, until one day when the two of us were taking a romantic walk past the Swan Lake, Parker suddenly turned to me and said, You're so beautiful, Maddie. And if you just put on a few more pounds, I swear you'll be the hottest girl at school. Yes, I know, but it's hard for me to gain weight. No big deal. Just leave it to me. I'll fatten you up. I thought Parker was just joking, but it turns out he was being deadly serious. Since that day, every time we went on a date, instead of taking me to the bowling alley and movies as usual, Parker would take me out to eat. I swear, I've tried all the restaurants in our town. More surprisingly, on my birthday, Parker even gave me a bouquet of fried chicken. How romantic! But this didn't change anything, as my weight still stayed the same. Parker was disappointed when he peered over me and saw the scales hadn't budged. Then he sighed out. How come you and Valerie are friends, but look totally opposite? Here comes our adorable chubby Valerie. What? Parker called Valerie adorable again. This wasn't the first time either. Annoyed, I put down my fork and walked away from them. After that, I started avoiding Valerie. I did homework with other friends, sat with other girls at lunch, and every time I happened to see Valerie, I turned around and walked away. Honestly, I didn't want it to be this way, but... Just seeing her made me uncomfortable. But I couldn't bear to see my boyfriend call my BFF cute while he thought I was too skinny. (sighs) Then summer break finally rolled around. I thought it'd be just me and Parker, but then he went off to a summer camp in Spain. (sighs) The plan was all ruined. So I spent a whole sunny day inside sulking. What's wrong? Are you bored because your lover is away? So why don't you take this time to surprise him when he returns? Surprise? A great idea popped into my head. But, but how do I get chubby? Easy peasy. Okay, if it's that easy, then show me. Okay, if you do my summer homework for me. What? She's such an opportunist but I really wanted to pile on the pounds and please Parker. So, without hesitation, I nodded in agreement. So, from that day on, I started following Camilla's weight gain plan. I switched veggies for greasy foods, and my main meal was always late at night. I also changed water for milkshakes, but I did have to stop drinking them when the smell of milk alone made me feel sick. Seeing me eating crazy like that, my parents worriedly said, Madeline, eating healthily is important, else your health will be affected. But I ignored their advice. This time, I definitely had to gain weight. Finally, after a month of trying, I gained some weight. Yay! I looked a lot more attractive now, didn't I? I was studying myself in the mirror when I heard my phone beep. It was Parker. He was coming over tomorrow with a present for me. The next day, I put on this hot dress that I'd never felt confident enough to wear before, and I asked Camilla to help me do my makeup. As soon as I finished, I eagerly waited for Parker in the living room. The doorbell rang. I excitedly opened the door, but as soon as he saw me, Parker quickly said, Oh, sorry. I have the wrong house. Then he started to leave. Huh? He didn't recognize me? This will be fun. No, honey, you're not mistaken. It's me. Your destiny. Madeline? Is that really you? Oh my, how on earth can you be this big? We've only been apart for a month. So, you don't think I'm prettier now? To my surprise, Parker shook his head. No, no, you're so fat now. It doesn't look okay. Lose some weight. Huh? This was so confusing. I thought he wanted me to be bigger. As annoying as this was, I still listened to Parker and tried to lose the weight I'd put on. (sighs) 
So it turns out that losing weight is far trickier than it sounds. Actually, it's a million times harder to lose it than it is to gain it. After a month of healthy eating and exercise, I gained another pound. Ugh! Stop eating that. Are you giving up already? You must try harder. What? It's just some popcorn. Why does he have to be so rude about this? I'll give you two weeks to lose weight. Else we're done. Huh? What did he just say? Done? He was the one who wanted me to gain weight in the first place. Now he was threatening to break up with me if I didn't lose it. How ridiculous. You know what? I don't need two weeks. Let's end it right now. It's clear you never loved me at all. You only like my appearance. If you truly cared about me, you wouldn't care what size I was. Then I walked off. Ugh, how could I have been so stupid? For the entirety of my relationship with that jerk Parker, I was blindly following him. I only cared about pleasing him, and it cost me so many things, including my best friend. I needed to apologize to her right away. I nervously knocked on the door, then waited. Finally, Valerie opened it, but on seeing me, she went to shut it. I'm so sorry. Just let me explain, please. Valerie, I'm so sorry. It was all because I was afraid Parker would leave me for you. But I realize now that he's a massive jerk, and I was an idiot for ever trying to change for him. Jeez, you're crazy. Parker is totally not my type. I scratched my head and told her about how terrible Parker had treated me and how I'd foolishly listened to him. Man, that douchebag! Then she hugged me. Valerie confessed to me that she'd been trying to lose weight by lowering her calorie intake, but the pounds were coming off. And worse still, she felt weak and tired all the time. I nodded in agreement with her. So, from then on... Valerie and I made a promise to love ourselves, regardless of what size we were, and to never let anyone try and change us. And look, that's Walker and Joel, our awesome boyfriends who love us just the way we are. And you know what? It feels so good not caring what other people think. So don't ever let idiots put you down, because when you allow yourself to just be you, then you can finally realize just how beautiful you truly are. Finally, back in my natural habitat. Now these city kids could see what I'm capable of. Behold, my big, beautiful flame. They were in awe of my skill. When suddenly, the fun was put to an end by some overreacting teachers. They started yelling at me, saying there's a rule against fire. Ugh, how could you call this a campsite if campfire is not even allowed? Fire making is an essential survival skill, y'all. These boring city people don't know a thing. Who needs all their rules anyway? I know I don't. Hi, I'm Nova, the fire hazard. And I didn't always live in the city. I spent the first 14 years of my life on the road. Our family used to travel the country in our RV. We never stayed any place more than a couple of months. We foraged for food and slept under the stars. But my world was flipped upside down when my parents decided to divorce. My mom wanted to settle down and my dad would continue life on the road. I begged to go with dad, but mom had custody of me. I'd love to stay with you, my little birdie, but I have to go. No cage can hold me for too long. At that moment, I promised myself I would break free and spread my wings too. My mom and I then settled into a small two-bedroom apartment in Savannah, Georgia, where we were greeted by our neighbors, Brenda Foster, a middle school teacher, and her son, Scott, who I'd soon be attending school with. Mrs. Foster was really friendly, but from the moment I met Scott, I knew we wouldn't get along. City people were always grumpy and glued to their cell phones. Mom had to work two jobs just to make ends meet. Accountant by day, Burger King employee by night. Her colorful wardrobe was replaced with dull uniforms, and all we ate now was fast food. I still kept a sheer hope that one day, when Mom makes enough money, we will hit the road again soon, but... No, this is going to be our forever home. Things might be hard for you at first, but trust me, it'll be good for you in the long run. That sounds like she wants my life to be this boring and stuffy for all eternity. Then came school. 
There were tons of rules, and every moment of our day was scheduled. In just one morning, I got in trouble for going to the bathroom and for eating my lunch. And on top of that, every teacher complained about my penmanship and spelling. But things were worse when I was among other kids. I could hear their whispers everywhere I went. One girl even came up to me and asked why I wore weird hippie clothes. My clothes aren't weird, you are! Even when some of them invited me to sit with them at lunch, I felt like an outsider. Anyone down for some pink drinks after school? Not me. I'm saving up for the era's tour. Count me in! I'm entering my pink girl era. None of these words they say makes any sense to me. Finally, they asked about my old life. Well, we didn't have to eat this junk. We can get fresh vegetables by the road. And I know how to skin roadkills. And every day we tried many different fruits and fungi. But be careful, a simple mushroom could kill you. But by that point, I noticed they were either speechless or as pale as a ghost. Did I say something wrong? Every school day was a blur of confusing subjects. But today was my first music lesson, and I was so excited to finally do something I was good at. When the music teacher, Mr. Shapiro, asked if anyone wanted to perform for the class, I sprung up from my seat, ready to go. I confidently sang my favorite song, but halfway through, Mr. Shapiro interrupted me. We're learning classical music. That style is called reggae, which we don't teach here. <laughs> Nova's a hippy-dippy weirdo. The whole class erupted into laughter. What did I do? Ugh, Scott! I was so gonna give him a taste of my rosewood guitar, but everyone held me back. In the end, Mr. Shapiro said he'd be talking with our moms after school. Scott and his mom had already left before my mom came. Mr. Shapiro told her that I was a violent hothead who always dressed inappropriately. I waited for my mom to defend me, but she simply apologized. I'll talk to her about this later. Please excuse her behavior. She has never been to school before. Who was this woman and what had she done to my mother? Later, I told my mom how terrible school was, the constant staring and teasing, the way that everyone seemed to be a little afraid of me. Contrary to my expectations, she told me I should try harder to blend in, and she even had bought me normal clothes for school. Mom, clothes are my self-expression. I'm not changing just to fit in. What happened to you? Didn't you teach me to be myself? I did, but now I need you to blend in so you can make friends. I... I had to leave before bursting into tears. I couldn't stay in the stuffy apartment any longer. So I went out the window, climbed down the fire escape, and just ran away. But at one point, I realized I didn't know where to go. So I wandered around until I bumped into the Fosters, who insisted on walking me back home. Strangely, Scott seemed less annoying now, and kept looking awkwardly at me the whole way home. My mom was clearly surprised to see me when she opened the door. I felt like a joke, because she hasn't even noticed my rebellious great escape. I couldn't sleep that night. After thinking it over, I came to the conclusion that I could get my old life back if I found my dad. If only I knew how. The next morning at school, I went looking for the tools I needed to find my dad. Compass, flashlight, map. Scott? What are you up to in there? You first. I wanted to apologize for what happened in music class yesterday. Your turn. I'm gathering what I need to go find my dad, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. Stop you? It looks like you need help. Those things may have helped you hundreds of years ago, but these days we just use the internet. I didn't want Scott's help, but maybe he was right. I had no clue where to start, and I could hardly even figure out how to use my cell phone. <sighs> maybe I need a little help to learn about the internet. Follow me. Scott spent that afternoon teaching me the basics of the internet. He also asked about my old life, and I found myself telling him everything. All the things I missed and hated about this new life. To my surprise, he was understanding. His mother was a single mom too, and it had been years since he heard from his father. After that day, I thought I hated him a bit less. About a week later, I felt like I was ready to start my search. Little did I know, googling my dad's name would give me literally millions of results. I was about to give up when I saw some people looking for their dogs. Hmm, that just gave me an idea. I printed as many flyers as the library would allow, and spent the next day putting them up around the neighborhood. I was surprised by a strange phone number. Hello? Yeah, hi. I just saw a clueless hippie wandering around, and I think they matched the description you provided. I was over the moon by how quick I got a response. But then I saw Scott, half a block away, grinning at me with a cell phone in his hand. That internet thing you taught me is useless. Finding people is not that fast, even with the internet. Your best bet would be the database at the police station. Are you sure you... I didn't need to hear any more words and immediately flagged down a police car passing by. Over here, officer! The officer pulled over and rolled down his window. Morning, sir. 
Please take us to the station. What are you kids doing? Where are your parents? Well, I'm looking for my dad. I heard the officer speak into his intercom, saying he was bringing a lost child back to the station. Well, that's not what I meant, but whatever does the job, I guess. As he led me into the back of the car, I remembered. Sir, he's with me. Should we bring him too? Correction, two lost kids. Scott was obviously stunned, as the police officer escorted us into his car. It's hilarious! <laughs> of course, I need my sidekick with me to help me find that database thingy. Shortly after arriving at the station, the officer left the room to get us some water. As soon as the door closed behind him, I sprung into action. I had to look in every corner, but Scott wasn't helping. Come help me! Where could that database thingy be in this room? What? No, dummy, it's in here. Then he jumped to the computer and did some clicking. Type your dad's name here. Keep an eye out. In an instant, a file with my dad's info came up. I printed it out and sprinted home before the ink could dry. My heart was pounding as I dialed my dad's number. Hey, yo! Dad, it's so good to hear your voice. Uh, who is this? It's me, Dad. Complete silence on the other end. Did I call the wrong number? It's me, Nova? Nova! Glad to hear from you. Guess what, kid? I've been up to all kinds of adventures. Then he talked to me about his amazing trips that I would have loved to be on. Then I asked where he was so I could go find him. I live in the moment, my little birdie. I go where the road takes me. Please, Dad, let me tag along. Okay, meet me at the exit of the interstate at 10 p.m. tomorrow. He ended the call before I could say anything else. I felt the sudden urge to cry for some reason. They must be happy tears. I was finally seeing my dad again. But how could I get there? Maybe my sidekick Scott could help me. If he had made it back from the police station... Oopsies! I ran to Scott's apartment, and to my surprise, he answered the door. Hey, how did you get home? Once I explained to the officer that you were just a little eccentric, he let me go. I'm sorry I left you there. I wasn't really thinking. Oh, I spoke to my dad, and he's picking me up tomorrow night. So, I need your help to get to the highway. The highway? What kind of parent asks his 14-year-old to meet him at the highway at night? Did he even ask you how you were doing? Or your mom? He clearly doesn't care at all. Wait, yeah, he really didn't ask. But dad probably was just busy. We can talk all about it tomorrow when we meet anyway. How dare Scott think ill of him? What do you know about my dad? He's a free spirit, and I should be traveling with him. Life's all about being spontaneous. My mom doesn't even understand it anymore, so I don't expect you to. But if you don't want to help me, fine. I'll figure it out myself. Then I stormed off. The night after, I was struggling with Google Maps. My phone was suddenly snatched out of my hand. I'll take you there. You might get lost if you go alone. I was still a little upset about yesterday, but that was nice of him. Plus, Scott was right. I would get lost on my own. We arrived early and waited. The hours dragged by, so I called Dad several times, but no answer. When I saw it was past 11 p.m., my call finally came through. Oh, man. You were there now? Our bus passed Savannah a while ago. <laughs> we're having a grand party. You should see. Oh, uh, well, maybe we'll cross paths again soon. Bye, little birdie. He hung up right away. I noticed Scott watched me for a reaction, but I couldn't hold it in and burst into tears. Scott got us on the bus to go home. I was sobbing the entire way and couldn't talk through all the tears. Eventually, Scott spoke up. When my parents divorced, I spent a lot of time being mad at my mom, too. I couldn't understand why she didn't make my dad stay. But she did try to, right? Nope. She just accepted it. And I eventually realized that she wasn't weak like I had thought. She chose to stay to make sure my life was normal. Leaving would have been easy. And what she did, keeping the lights on actually took a lot more strength. What Scott said sounded surprisingly mature. After that, we sat in silence for a while. I understood what Scott was saying, but I didn't think it applied to my case. My mom was just not the person she used to be. We arrived home very late. Before we parted, Scott said, Why don't you ask your mom why she decided to settle down here? Kids don't always understand why parents do certain things. Maybe you should hear her out. I nodded and took a deep breath before opening the door. My mom was on the phone with the cops, and as soon as she saw me, she ran to give me the biggest hug I had gotten in a long time. She asked me where I'd been, and I told her everything. How I tried to find Dad, how he stood me up, and things Scott said earlier. She listened to me attentively, then said what Dad did was terrible, but not exactly out of character. You know how we stopped by a town from time to time? Working temporary jobs like waiting tables and washing cars, right? What you didn't know is that your father always messed up and got fired a few days after he started. So he decided that he'd look after you while I worked. 
I didn't realize how hard mom had always been working while me and dad were just carelessly having fun. Then I asked why she chose that life in the first place. When I met him, I was working a 9 to 5 job that I hated. While your dad was all about, the world is a book, traveling makes you a storyteller. Of course, that sounded fascinating, so I quit my job and set myself free on the RV we bought. But why did you decide to settle down after all these years? After having you, I realized our wandering life wasn't a good environment for a kid. I was worried you'd have a hard time once you got older, especially because your dad wasn't being helpful and was only being a bad example for you. Besides, homeschooling is difficult. We aren't teachers. You deserve to grow up in a stable home, have friends your age, and create deep connections with them. I got you two, and... and people we met from all over the country. But not enough, honey. I thought I should give you a normal life while you're still young. You'll be better prepared to make your own decisions later as an adult. It was unfair to you. Because you didn't choose that life. We did. The resentment I had towards my mom melted away. In its place was a profound gratitude for all that she sacrificed. I wasn't good with words, so I told her that the best way I could. Do you miss our old life? Well, yes. But for now, you're my number one priority. After the hurt's gone, it was time to heal. I tried to focus on my lessons and learn the rules. My mom even helped me pick out clothes that were more appropriate for school, but still felt like me. I tried my best to enjoy the same movies as other kids and learn to play their favorite songs on my guitar. Soon enough, they became my new friends. I continued to grow even closer to Scott, my friend and partner in crime, from the start. Still, my mom and I agreed that we shouldn't totally abandon our love for travel, and she promised that we would plan a few big road trips every year, starting this summer. I can hardly wait for our trip to Niagara Falls with Mrs. Foster and Scott. I walked into school, with whispers following me, but is it just me, or did the crowd seem even more chatty today? I nervously walked up to my locker and, oh my god, splattered across it was the stamp Teenage Karen in spray paint. I shivered from embarrassment, surrounded by giggles and gawping faces. I ran straight into the bathroom and shut myself in a cubicle to calm down. You might be wondering, how did I get here? I don't sound like those unreasonable, cocky people that usually grow into Karens, right? Because I'm not one of them. However, I realize how my actions could have caused this situation. I was adopted into one of those wealthy families who pressured their children to grow successful and flawless. As a result, I have never got any lower grade than an A or lost a competition. I was that perfect child that was too scared to fail. Because nobody had ever taught her how failures work. But then one day, everything changed. One casual school day, I walked into the literature class and saw an unknown boy already occupying my desk. All the girls were giving him dreamy looks. Hey! I tapped on his shoulder. Is this your seat? Yes! Oh, sorry, I didn't know. He then moved to another desk. I forced a polite smile and took my seat. Then our literature teacher announced that we would have a little test today, not affecting our grades. Being the teacher's pet around here, I could tell this was because she wanted to test Austin, that new boy. Okay, fine by me. Another A-plus to add to my collection. But only, I somehow couldn't concentrate. I looked out of the window, trying to find some writing inspiration, but that new guy was blocking my view. Okay, to be fair, he looks pretty cute. Without realizing it, I started staring at him. Then suddenly he turned to me. We made eye contact, which startled me. Oh gosh, wake up, Catherine. You have a test to finish. I tried to focus on my essay again, but I kept having this feeling of him looking at me. Jesus, I hope he didn't get the wrong idea. I'm not like those girls who only go to school to check out cute boys. Time's up. I nervously turned in my paper, as I knew I was distracted and didn't deliver my best. But never mind, nobody could beat me, even on my worst days. Well, not this time. The following day, the teacher handed me back my work and whispered, I don't know what happened, but it's okay. Don't worry. Huh? I quickly took the paper and... B minus? Okay, I knew I couldn't get an A plus with this one, but not even a normal A? 
I've never had a bee before. The disappointed faces of my parents popped up in my mind. What if they wouldn't want me anymore? They adopted me, gave me this luxurious, perfect life, and this is how I thanked them? I started to panic and looked around to find the teacher. I needed to clear this up. And that's when I caught a glimpse of Austin's paper. An A? No way! I slammed it on the table and stood up. I protest this grade. There must have been some mistake. Can you please look over my essay? Oh, don't worry. This isn't an official test, so it's fine. No, it's not fine. How can I possibly be worse than this new kid? You have to reconsider it, or I'll take it to the principal. Kate, you're being unreasonable. Sit down, or I'll take you to the principal. I took a deep breath and calmed myself while sitting down. There were whispers about me circulating the class, but I couldn't care less, as I had this B- minus to deal with. My parents could never know about this. After this, I knew my friends were just pretending to be okay with me. As one time, when we had to team up for the relay running in PE class, no one picked me. In the end, Coach Malone had to add me to a group. And guess what? It's the group of Austin and his fangirls. I hate this. And look at him. Such a thorn in my eye. I wish I could just throw this baton in his annoying face. But, thud, I fell face down just inches away from Austin. Are you okay? Just take the dumb baton and go. Ugh, this dude is definitely bad luck. I crawled up, then suddenly I heard giggles. It was a group standing by the track lanes with their phones up. Were they laughing at me? I stormed over to them with my hands up to cover their cameras. What's so funny? Do you have any common courtesy? Um, chill out. It's not- Has no one taught you to help others in need? Not record them and laugh over it? No, listen. Funny story. We actually- So you still think it's funny? Delete that video right now! No, you can't! Just- Just hear us out! But that only made me madder and yank on the phone even harder. Then, oops, the phone went flying and hit the hard concrete ground. Oh no, I didn't mean to. The boy whose phone it was freaked out and ran over to pick it up. Look what you've done! Who would ever want to film you? We were just making a performance video for the cheerleading team. Through the cracked screen of his phone, I saw a video of the cheerleaders practicing on the field on the other side of the track lanes. Oh no, this was so embarrassing! I quickly asked for the guy's contact and promised I'll make up for his broken phone, then ran back to my class. I felt exhausted. It's like the whole world was against me. But at least there was always one thing that could ease my soul. Yes, it's my books. That's why whenever I feel drained, I'd go to the school library to relax. So, like every other time, I made my way there, but I think I'd forgotten my library card. Oh well, no big deal, as the librarian, Mrs. Flenderson, is basically family to me at this rate. She doesn't even ask for my card anymore. Hi, Mrs. Flenderson, I said as I passed by the librarian's desk, but then I was taken aback by some unfamiliar voice. Um, where are you going? Card, please? It turned out Mrs. Flenderson was out of the office, and there's this freshman who volunteered to fill in. I asked her nicely to let me in, but she kept on saying no while chewing on her gum, which drove me crazy. Ugh. Listen, do you know who I am? I don't need some dumb card to get in here. Yeah, yeah, but not on my watch. Look, half of these books are from my family's donation. You should be showing some more respect, kiddo. Your snobby opinions won't work with me. Here, we attend the same school, so we're all equal and rules are rules. Let me speak to your supervisor. Call Mrs. Flenderson. You're such a Karen. I froze upon hearing that word. That was the first time I'd been called by that nickname, and only then I realized how much of a fuss I'd been making here. But it's just that I was already in such a terrible mood all I wanted was to just go to my safe place, and that too was impossible now. 
I then quickly composed myself and walked away. But to my dismay, some passerby had been watching me throw a tantrum since God knows when. And yep, Austin was there too. Why would I be surprised anymore? My stories at the running track, also at the library, soon spread around the school like wildfire. People didn't try to hide the fact that they were avoiding me anymore and started calling me Karen. So, obviously, this one time when we had to pair up in literature class for the midterm essay, I was left alone again. At least, that's what I thought, until Austin leaned over and asked me to be his partner. Though I hated his guts, I could not fail his test. So, yeah, I've agreed. We met up later that day at his house. I was enthusiastically showing him some of the book options for our essays topic, but he was totally unbothered, scrolling through his phone. Yeah, yeah, whichever you like. He'll be taking care of all this anyway. What do you mean? Look, I only paired up with you because you're so good at this. So please just do your thing. Whatever. I don't care. I hate these. You don't like literature? But last time you scored an A. Oh, that? Don't be too bitter, as I just copied your work and changed it around a bit. So technically it's your A too. Yay, congrats. What? So all of the stress I had to bear these past few weeks turned out was just because he cheated? Ugh, I was so angry. Feeling on emotional overload, I burst out crying which got Austin flustered. Hey, what's wrong? Calm down. Don't cry. I'm sorry. Please stop crying. Then through tears, I started telling him about all the pressure I have to bear from my parents' expectations and about all the Karen mishaps I've gotten caught up with lately at school. At one point, Austin apologized to me as he realized this all originated from the act of him copying my essay. That night, we didn't get anything done for the essay but we just sat down and talked. After such an oversharing session, Austin and I naturally got closer to each other. In fact, he became the only friend I had at school. It's nice to have a friend again, but it's still hard when your reputation at school was totally ruined and everyone knew you as teenage Karen. Especially when I had a big speech contest coming up. I hadn't been in the right mind to study, so I barely had anything prepared for the competition. I kept imagining my parents' disappointed faces when I didn't win first place. The night before the contest, I was so stressed out that I had to pour it all out into my diary in hope that I would feel lighter and ready for the big day. Then suddenly my phone rang. It was Austin. Hey. Good luck tomorrow, Kate. See you there. Thanks. I don't know anymore. Are you still stressed over it? If you're this worn out because of it, then... I know a cure. What is it? Just quit. It's just some contest. And you don't have to come first in everything. We're all just human after all. You're crazy. <laughs> okay, I'll get some sleep now. See you tomorrow. But my mind was too cluttered with thoughts and worries to sleep. The next morning, I arrived in front of the competition venue, but hesitated to go inside. Then suddenly... I found myself running away from that building while phoning Austin. Meet me at the park, West Gate. Ten minutes later, he arrived in his car. I hopped in the front seat then said, Let's go to the theme park. I want to have fun. Austin looked at me, stunned. But then he smiled and drove off without a question. Yep, just like that. I dropped out of the contest and turned off my phone to just enjoy a day being a teenager. I went on all the scariest roller coaster rides, screaming my heart out, leaving all my worries behind. By dusk, I was 100% ready for my parents' tantrum. They probably would disown me now, but I felt strangely calm. As Austin drove up to my house, I could see my mom pacing back and forth in the front yard. There she was, already waiting to punish me. Upon seeing me, mom ran straight over and gave me a hug. Oh my god, honey, where have you been all day? We've been worried sick about you. Wait, what's going on? Why isn't she angry? Then dad also ran over to us as soon as he spotted me, holding something in his hand. Sweetie, I'm so sorry for not knowing how much you've been through. 
We didn't realize our high expectations were putting so much pressure on you. We might have been too strict on you, but I want you to know that we'll always love you, no matter what. Oh, Dad was holding my diary. So, they know everything now. I cried tears of relief. It was so good to know they finally understood my feelings, and they even swore to change and try to listen to me more. That day, I realized that my parents loved me unconditionally, and whatever happened in my life, they would never give me up. What's up, teenage Karen? Um, yeah, my friends still call me Karen. But it's okay, as they only call me it in a jokey way. Nothing mean or anything. I'm over everything that happened, and so is everyone else. It's all just memories now, but thanks to that Karen phase, I was reminded not to be so strict on myself, so I don't end up being a Karen to my own self again. <laughs> I'm standing in the middle of the room, wearing this extravagant dress and a glittery mask. All eyes are on me, but I can sense how ingenuine they are. This is supposed to be my sweet 16th, and yet all of these guests were complete strangers. Ugh, it's all that slimeball Gregory's fault. Actually, this OTT party was all down to him. Oh, hi, I'm Vivian, but my friends call me Viv. My mom, Jacqueline Mars, is one of the wealthiest people on Earth. So, I grew up thinking massive mansions, gigantic pools, and a floor entirely for toys was the norm. Well, at least I did until I turned 10. That day I was playing in my life-size dollhouse when I heard talking coming from the other side of the fence. I peeked over it and saw a woman and a girl around my age who looked kind of weird. Curious, I spoke up. Hey you, why do you dress so funny? Pardon? What did you say? You don't even have shoes on. That's so silly. You're the silly one. Bet you've never tasted this before, huh? So try it. Spoiled rich kids like you always look down on others. While in fact, you're no use to society. I just stood there dumbfounded as the security shooed them away. I never meant to offend her. I, I was just curious. So I rushed inside the house to find mom and ask her about this. Oh, honey. Not anyone can be as wealthy as we are. That means you don't have to worry about a thing, sweet pea. Now go play so mommy can work, okay? Even to this day, mom's words still linger in my ears. I've grown to resent my family's wealth. I just wanted to be a normal kid. That's why, by the time I got to middle school, I convinced mom to let me transfer from my private school to a public one and wipe out everything about me online, so no one would know about my influential family. I get the bus to school, buy clothes from thrift shops, and prepare my own lunch instead of bringing the gourmet dish the chefs make for me. A perfect normal life. Until Gregory, mom's so-called boyfriend, showed up. He sticks his big nose in everything. Thanks to him, mom wouldn't stop nagging at me about my clothing, my trashy public school, or how I gotta stop hanging out with the mediocre kids. Ugh, he is driving me insane. And to top it off, he gave mom the idea of throwing me a 16th birthday party. I hate attention. Mom knows this. But what Gregory wants, Gregory gets. This could be an opportunity to introduce her to society and gain new associates. It'd be good for her when she takes over business in the future, blah, blah, blah. Poof. Please. The only thing that man cares about is himself and his associates, not mine. In the end, I agreed to a masquerade ball on one condition. Mom has to stop interfering with who I should or shouldn't hang out with, especially my friends at school. And that brings us to the present, right when the host announces that it's time for my first dance? Huh? My what now? Ugh, Gregory. I was confusedly looking around to find a partner when suddenly a hand grabbed me. Birthday girl, come dance with me. Ugh, what a creep. Let go. Can somebody help me with this? Suddenly a boy around my age appeared. Oh my, he has the most beautiful gray eyes I've ever seen. Excuse me, sir. I believe the lady has agreed to have her first dance with me. Thank you, handsome stranger. As we danced, I couldn't help but stare dreamily into those gorgeous eyes of his. We were about to leave the dance floor when he whispered in my ear, Wait here, I'll be right back. <sighs> Who would have thought? A superficial party like this would lead me to my perfect guy. 
Suddenly, I heard a snapping sound behind me, and as I turned around, my mask fell off. Oh no, a paparazzi cut my mask string. I tried to cover my face with my hands, but it was no use. Luckily, Mum rushed over and hid me behind her. Sorry everyone, but the party's over. We had a great time and hope to see you all again soon. Then she led me back to my room, while the security showed everyone the way out. From that moment on, my ordinary life ended for good. My face was plastered all over the internet as the billionaire Jacqueline Mars' daughter. Now everyone at school is looking at me funny. I don't get it, guys. I'm still the same old Viv. Oh, there my besties are. They would surely have my back, right? But nope. As I approached them, they went ballistic on me, saying how I don't trust them enough to confess about my actual background, so from now on we're no longer friends. This is so unfair. I never asked for any of this. I wipe away my tears, trying to act like nothing happened. Huh? What's this? There's a note lying on top of my books that says, Hey, it's me, the guy from your birthday party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. If you need anyone to talk to, text me anytime. Oh, so he's from our school? Wow, just when I thought no one's there for me, he showed up again. But there's no name though. Is he still playing this mysterious game? Okay, I'll just call him my mask tonight then. From that day on, we texted non-stop. He just gets me. My family situation, my friends, everything. One time he even secretly slid a Blackpink concert ticket in my bag, since I once told him that I was their diehard fan. Another time, he sent me a gift card to my all-time favorite ice cream store, Ben & Jerry's, just to cheer me up on a bad day. Aww. This ice cream tastes delicious, but I can't help wishing the Masked Knight was here with me. All I know is he has the most beautiful gray eyes and gorgeous black hair. Hmm. Oh, speak of the devil. Hey, I have a surprise for you this Valentine's Day. Hope you're as excited to see me as I am to see you. Finally, I get to meet the boy I'm crazy about. I can't wait. On Valentine's Day, I was in English staring out of the window and thinking about my masked knight. I wonder what he looks like. Ladies, I brought your Valentine's roses. Here you go, Viv. This is it. It's gotta be from him. Happy Valentine's Day. Have a taste of the rose, then come meet me at the pool. X. I quickly unwrapped the candy, popped it into my mouth, then rushed to meet my dream man. Well, where was he? As I tried calling him, the room started to spin. I saw the outline of a blurred black figure, then... Ugh... My head is killing me. Where am I? And whose hand am I holding? Hold on. Those eyes. He must be. Thank goodness you're awake. Uh, are you the one who danced with you at your birthday party? In the flesh. I'm Jeremiah, by the way. I had higher hopes for our first face-to-face -face meeting, but oh well. <laughs> Turns out, he always knew I went to the same school as him but he was a bit intimidated by my family's influence, so he decided to get to know me via text first. He said the cops had found some sort of sleep-inducing substance in my rose candy. Before I could quiz him anymore on this, Mom barged into the room and hugged me. After making sure I was okay, she turned to Jeremiah and said, You saved my daughter. For that, I can never thank you enough. Please join us for dinner tomorrow night. Jeremiah seemed hesitant at first, but then he nodded in agreement. Hmm. The dinner did not go as planned. Between Mum's blatant interrogating and Gregory's menacing looks, I could sense Jeremiah's discomfort. Then when Jeremiah asked where the restroom was, Gregory insisted on showing him. When Jeremiah returned, he seemed flustered and made his excuses to leave. Gah. What had that annoying Gregory said to him? I quickly followed Jeremiah and apologized but he just smiled and offered to pick me up for school tomorrow. The cops haven't found the culprit yet, so from now on, I'll be your guardian. How sweet. After that, I hung out with him every day. Great, right? Only, somehow it didn't feel the same as when we were texting. Back then we had a deep connection. Now it was just like two friends hanging out. Oh, and not to mention Olivia. 
Jer's childhood friend who can't seem to leave him alone for more than two seconds. One time, Jer and I were at the movies together, but guess who coincidentally appeared and plonked herself down next to him? Yep, Olivia. Worse still, with their giggling and popcorn sharing, I felt like the third wheel. I was not having this again, so I just left for home in this random cab parked outside the theater. But bad luck. The driver doesn't know the way. He doesn't even have a phone, and I had to lend him mine for GPS. The guy snatched it out of my hand immediately. Rude! But wait, it was 9pm already. Why did he still have shades on? And even wore a mask? Right then, I realized the car had passed the town's border. Stop! The car suddenly filled with smoke, and the last thing I thought was, he has eyes that were exactly like... Jairs. I woke up finding myself in this old, cobwebby room. Where is this place? And that driver guy? I have to get out of here now. <clears throat> right at that moment, he came into the room with a smile. Don't you recognize me? Will you have another dance with me? Because I'd love that. What is happening right now? What he just said? Did that mean... He's the actual masked knight? Maybe that's why I don't feel connected to Jeremiah. Why did Jer lie to me then? So many questions popped up in my head, then suddenly I heard a car stop outside. That guy immediately went to check. This could be my chance of escaping. By the time I got downstairs, I saw the driver guy talking to... Jeremiah. So I hid behind the door and watched on. Cameron, just stop this. Getting revenge on our father is one thing, but this is a step too far. Take Viv back to her family now and end this. I know this looks bad, but trust me, I'd never hurt Viv. I didn't mean for her to fall into the pool. That's why I jumped in to save her. But I need her as bait to show the world what that jerk Gregory is like. He doesn't deserve to be her father. <gasps> I muzzled myself in shock. Gregory is their father? And that Cameron guy was the one saving me, not Jer? Don't you forget who abandoned us when Mom had a close brush with death, then took all our business and properties, even our home, leaving us helpless? That jerk deserves all he gets. I was trying to process it all, when another car arrived. Gregory's. I quickly hid under the stairs before he walked in with a bunch of bodyguards. Cameron, Jeremiah, my sons, haven't you grown up so fast? Cut to the chase. Give us back the business, and what's rightfully ours. Then we'll let your stepdaughter go. Huh, <laughs> indeed. Like father, like sons. Very smart. But still amateurs, my boys. You see, all that girl is to me is an obstacle blocking my way to the inheritance. So please, be my guest and take care of that little Miss Annoying. Aren't you afraid we'll expose everything you just said? And who's gonna believe you now? Jacqueline is mesmerized by me so she'd believe anything I say. <laughs> that snake. How dare he speak of my mom like that? Unable to hold in my rage, I jumped out of my hiding spot and screamed at Gregory. What did you say about my mom? You slimy, lying traitor. Nice talking to you all, but the fun has to end here. Goodbye. The guards lunged forward, about to tie me up when... The cops smashed the door coming in, and behind them was... Mom! Stop right there! How dare you do this to my daughter! Gregory's face turned paler than a ghost as he mumbled out, Jackie, honey, why you're here? Um, but just in time to save our baby, Vivian. Cut the act. I already heard everything you said. And you're going to jail for a long time. Then the cops led him and took his crook guards away. Seeing Mom... I was so happy I rushed to hug her. Turns out, her investigations of the pool incident led her to Cameron. So when she confronted him, he eventually told her everything. That's how they came up with a plan to catch Gregory red-handed. Mom and the cops had been waiting in ambush around here for Gregory to show up. Then, well, you know the rest. A lot has happened in three months. Mom finally finished all the legal stuff, so now the property Gregory had merged with hers to gain her trust is now signed back over to Cam and Jeremiah. I realized that being wealthy isn't a bad thing. 
especially as it means with influence like this, I can help other less fortunate people and really make a difference. Now I help mom with her business and her charity work, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm proud of my hard-working, amazing mom, and I'm proud of who I am. And guess what? I now have real friends who like me for me. As for Jeremiah, well, he apologized about everything. He used to fear his brother was going to hurt me, so he lied to protect me. We made up, of course, and became the best of friends. I'm not sure I can say the same about his brother, though. He did everything he could to beg for my forgiveness, but I just can't. Then one day, Jer asked me to come by his home to visit his mom. She begged me not to think badly of her boys, especially Cameron. He's in love with you, you know? He always talks about you, and how he wishes things would have been different. Oh boy, her words are starting to have an effect on me. When I walked out the door, I saw Cameron sitting on the porch. He turned and looked at me, and I felt my heart pound for my grey-eyed, masked night. So, taking a deep breath, I walked over to him, just as the sun was setting. Really? You're from Korea? No way! You sound just like a native speaker. Richard jumped up in surprise as I told him I came from South Korea. Yeah, I'm 100% Korean! I answered him giggling. <laughs> I had spent hours every day practicing my English. Guess it has paid off. But that was six years ago already. I'm Jenny, by the way, and I'm Korean. At the time I was 21, I joined an online English speaking club where I first met Richard who never in a million years did I think I had fallen in love with, but that's exactly what happened. Ever since that very first class, we started talking every day, and the sparks between us were undeniable. He always mentioned how he wished I could be in the Czech Republic with him, and I found myself daydreaming about our future wedding. Okay, so I was getting ahead of myself, but he was just so amazing. After a month of talking nonstop, I realized I was probably going to fail college if I didn't start setting my priorities straight. But all I could think about was him. And whenever we weren't chatting, I was stalking him on social media. And every time I saw him tagged with another girl, I got so jealous. This couldn't be healthy. I mean, I hadn't even met him in real life. But still, we continued to fall for each other. And he even introduced me to his two best friends, Anastasia and Pavel, via video chat. But not as blossoming as my love life, I was failing miserably at college. I'd always been the one who laughed at my lovesick friends, and now I was no better than them. This wasn't right. Something had to change. So even though it was killing me inside to do this, one night before sitting down on my desk to work on my assignment, I just picked up my phone and blocked his WhatsApp, deactivated my Facebook, and all without letting him know. Yep. I full-on ghosted him. It was such a hard decision. Because that night, instead of getting anything done for the assignment, I found myself lying in bed with a tear-soaked pillow. It hurt so much, but I had to think about my future. My parents would kill me if I didn't get a good job. I couldn't let them down. Anyway, Pavel messaged me a few days later saying Richard had gone totally crazy and he'd never seen him this upset before. He barely ate anything and would drink all day. He's not much different from a zombie now, but I stayed unfazed. Bet he'd be okay, though. He was young and handsome, and girls were always after him. He'd get over me soon. And I'd get over him, right? If only it were that easy. I missed him every single day. Even though we'd been thousands of miles apart, he somehow always made me feel so safe, like he was right there next to me. What had I done? I had ruined everything. Ugh. Instead of wasting time overthinking, it'd be better to put all my energy into my studies for now. Right? And it worked. When graduation came around, I was the top student in my class and even got accepted on an exchange program in Australia. Without even thinking, I text Richard to tell him the good news. I apologized for disappearing on him and said it had messed with my mind because I hadn't expected to fall for him so hard. I had just needed some time to finish my studies, but now I was ready to reconnect again. Well, he'd seen my messages, but there was no reply. It felt like someone had punched me in the heart. Hours later, he finally replied and said, Sorry, Jenny. I'll get in touch soon. Now isn't the best time. I couldn't believe the words I was reading. I could actually hear the sound of my heart shattering, but it served me right. I was the one who'd gotten rid of him. He deserved better. But still, I stalked him every day online, 
and then I realized the only way to solve this would be to fly to the Czech Republic and find him. First, though, I had my exchange program in Australia. I bought a new phone and got a new number for the trip to leave my old one in Korea for my uncle who was always complaining about his outdated phone. Those three months in Australia were awesome, and I got my mind off things for a little. I was ready to start fresh when I got back from the trip, until my uncle told me that someone had texted me on my old phone, but because he didn't know English, he didn't know if it was for me or not. I immediately checked it, and there was a message from Richard that said, Jenny, I'm so sorry for my last message. I miss you so much. Your smile, your eyes, your voice. I hope you can give me another chance. Love, Richard. OMG! Months had passed since he'd sent it, and the worst part of all is that my uncle had read the message, and so it said seen. This was a disaster. Okay, but I had to focus on the positive. He missed me. Maybe it wasn't too late. I tried to call him, but he didn't answer, so I texted him and explained what had happened. He finally replied and said he thought I'd given up on him. I'd never give up on him. We then had a proper phone call. I am still thinking about you all the time. Why didn't you send me a Facebook message? The words tumbled out of my mouth in a rush, as if I was afraid I would lose contact with him again in any sec. Suddenly, he went all quiet, and then he told me he'd recently met someone, and that he hoped I'd understand and still want to be friends. I felt devastated. Why was it so hard for us? But in the end, there was no other choice for me. I just wished him well and hung up. All I could do now was move on. It was time to find someone else to date. Clearly, Richard and I weren't meant to be. My heart hurt, but I found a job and threw myself into it, giving it all my attention. Eventually, I got promoted, and after five years, I was able to help my parents pay off their debt. I even moved up to a management position. Of course, during this time, I dated a bit, but I couldn't make any of the relationships last. I just missed Richard all the time. I kept dreaming of us spending Christmas together. It was so frustrating. I mean, it had been five years, and we hadn't spoken at all. Why couldn't I just get over him? I occasionally went on his Facebook page, but all I could see was his profile pic that remained the same for years. I'd unfriended Anastasia and Pavel, too, so I couldn't stalk them either. For all I knew, he could be someone's husband now, maybe even a dad. And yet still, I never gave up hope that maybe we'd meet in real life, our paths would cross, and we'd finally get to be together. I couldn't stop thinking about this. And then three weeks before Christmas... I got a new following request on Instagram. I couldn't believe it. It was Pavel. And he was now married to Anastasia. This made me so happy. And he told me they were going on their honeymoon to Korea and hoped to see me. OMG, this was so exciting. I desperately wanted to ask him about Richard, but I was terrified to hear that he had kids or something. Anastasia messaged me too and asked how I was doing. I told her I was still single because I worked all the time. Hey, There was no way I could tell her it was because I was still obsessed with Richard. Anyway, the week flew by, and finally I was at the airport awaiting to meet Pavel and Anastasia in real life. They both looked so sweet, and I gave them the biggest hugs. After hugging them, I noted someone standing behind them. Oh, and gee, was that Richard? What was he doing there? I was so stunned I couldn't move. It it was really him. Pavel broke the silence by saying, We brought Richard along for you, Jenny. Feel free to hit him, bite him, kick him, or whatever you want to do if if you think he deserves it. Out of complete shock, I just burst into tears. It had been six long years of total silence, and now here he was, looking at me. I asked myself, could I hug him? But I didn't even get a chance to answer my thought because he ran towards me and picked me up in his arms, squeezing me tightly. Then he whispered in my ear, I'm so sorry, Jenny. Please don't cry. I'm here. I won't leave you, I promise. Could I trust him, though? I was still in shock as I drove them to their hotel, and then again later when I drove to take them out for some Korean food. I was nervous about hanging out with them all, but we seriously had the best night eating, drinking, and laughing. The next day, Pavel and Anastasia would start their honeymoon. So maybe then Richard and I would have some time alone together to talk about whatever was left between us. After dropping them back at their hotel, I was driving away when suddenly I saw Richard running back towards me. He said he wanted to tell me something, so I pulled over and we sat down on a bench to talk. I listened as he told me that over the past six years he tried to date other girls, but it never worked out because I was always in the back of his mind. He said he'd spend most of his time working so he could save up to visit me or buy me a ticket so I could come and visit him. It had taken him longer than he'd hoped because his parents had got divorced and he'd been looking after his mom who was super depressed. 
A few months later, she was diagnosed with cancer, and so he'd had to work even harder to help her pay for treatment. After three long years of fighting, she sadly passed away. And ever since then, he'd been feeling so lonely and sad. One day, he asked Pavel to contact me somehow. And when he found out I was still single, he was over the moon and decided it was finally time to come to Korea and see me. He said seeing me in real life had made him fall even more in love with me, which he hadn't thought was even possible. Then he hugged me tight and I couldn't stop crying. We spent Christmas together, just like I always dreamt of. And well, the rest is history. Here I am now, packing my bags to fly to the Czech Republic to see Richard. I can't wait to meet his family. And you'll never believe it, but we're even planning our wedding. The big question is, where do we live? Should I go there or should he move to Korea? To be honest, it doesn't matter. As long as we're together, it'll be perfect. So it's true what they say. If something is meant to be, it'll be. Even if it takes a year or six. All I know is that I'm glad I had the patience because I've never been happier. Ow. Jess, can we please take a break? Hmm. Fifteen minutes, okay? I'll go grab some Oreos. Our, Our favorite. favorite! Ugh. I hate chemistry. And it doesn't like me either. The only thing I know is that cafe has two chemical elements in it. Calcium and iron. <laughs> My parents are freaking out that I'll fail it. I don't know why. I mean, it's not like I want to be a scientist or anything. Anyway, they asked Jesse to tutor me. Currently, my grade's still lingering around the F mark, but there's no way I'm finding a new tutor. Why, you ask? Well, because Jess and I are the perfect match. We're both addicted to online shopping and love to read about the latest scandals to hit social media. And that quickly turned us into best friends. And this is my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, Bryce, which means attractive, brilliant, cute, darling, elegant, funny, gorgeous, and hot. I lab him. So you're probably wondering how I met such an awesome college boy. Well, it's all thanks to Jess, really. As turns out, she's one heck of a wing woman. So one time during the break, Jess was looking up her college forums when I spotted Bryce in one post. Wow, that's a hottie. You know him, Jess? I pointed at the post. She then replied, He's so your type, right? That's Bryce. I heard he's still single. Go for it. I'll get your back. Oh, that sounds interesting. I grinned back. After that, Jessie went into full-on detective mode. After only 10 minutes, she'd found what block he lived on, what he's majoring in, and even the name of his pet dog. And since then, she instructed me on how to text, reply to, and flirt with him. Cool, calm, and collected. It worked a treat, as by the end of the week, he'd asked me out on a date, and now he's my dreamy BF. He might look like the bad boy type, but underneath it all, he's sweet and shy, just like Edward Cullen. Aww. And guess what? We've been together for two months, and, um, we haven't kissed yet. But, so, how's it going with you and that hot college boy of yours? <sighs> I don't know. It's just recently, I feel like he's being cold with me. Just, I know he's read my messages, but he still takes ages to reply. And he never texts me goodnight anymore. Not like before. I'm trying. I mean, he seems happy with the pair of Jordan 4s and the new phone I bought him, but... <sighs> I'm not sure if he wants to be with me anymore. Of course he does, girl. You're a catch. He's probably just busy with his studies. I'm afraid he's cheating on me. You know, there's this Sally girl in Bryce's class. I often see that chick following him around, acting all friendly and making excuses to ask him to do stuff for her. Ugh, don't be silly. I bet they're just friends. This girl needed to watch out, as I wasn't going to let her just waltz in and steal my man. I slammed on the table. Seeing how frazzled I was, Jessie made a suggestion. We would take it in turns to follow Bryce wherever he went and find out exactly what he was up to. A few days later, I overheard Bryce on his phone talking about his study group at his house. Annoying Sally would be there too, of course. 
So being the bright spark I am, I paid the pizza delivery guy to attach a micro microphone inside the pizza to spy on him. But, ugh, the only thing I heard was Bryce's hungry stomach. Yuck. Another time Jesse texted me. Urgent. Saw Bryce in a jewelry shop buying an expensive necklace. Must be for Sally. Sorry. Fuming, I power walked the 20 blocks to his house. But his mom answered the door and proudly showed off the sparkly necklace Bryce had bought her for her birthday. Oops. Then, on one of my days to follow him, I decided to go in disguise. Um, the problem being, it was 28 degrees, so my choice of Sherlock Holmes outfit and fake beard wasn't the best idea. I'd just followed him into a grocery store when the world began to black out and I tumbled straight into a display of cans. The last thing I saw was a group of people leaning over me, including a confused-looking Bryce. Babe, you're awake, but why the freaky costume? I sighed, then replied, I'm sorry, it's just you've been so distant recently. Don't you like me anymore? He chuckled. Maddie, of course. I'm just busy with my graduation thesis. You know, I'm in my final year. Aha! So we were all good! Yay! So the next day, I bought us a set of those seriously cute couples rings from Tiffany & Co. to mark this. Peace was restored. At least for a short time. Lately, whenever we went out on a date, Bryce didn't pay attention to my words anymore and just had his eyes glued to his phone screen. Oof! He even chuckled and had this suspect twinkle in his eyes. So I tried leaning over at him to see what was so funny, but I couldn't see a thing, as his screen brightness was lowered to the minimum. What are you doing? I snatched his phone, but... What? Wrong password. I bought him this and set the password as our anniversary. Why won't you let me look at your phone? What are you hiding? Nothing, Mads. I just like my privacy sometimes, that's all. Now, come on, baby boo. I'll get you a chocolate muffin. There's no way I was turning that down. Especially as thinking about it, it's the only thing he'd ever bought for me. But as I nibbled on my muffin and watched him transfixed on his phone, I couldn't shake away the feeling that something was wrong. I couldn't drag Jesse into this mission, as her studies were occupying her attention at the moment. It's okay, I can solo it, and this time I won't faint, I swear. I did my research and found the perfect spy software. I know, I don't normally condone this sort of behavior, but Bryce was hiding something, and I needed to find out what it was. The software was simple to use. I just had to find a way to install it on Bryce's phone. The app itself could be hidden, leaving me free to read his messages without him ever finding out. Perfect. Mission one, how to install that software on Bryce's phone in a really short time? This is not an easy task, as Bryce is so obsessed with his phone, he even sleeps with it. On a few occasions, he does move away from it, but it's for a few minutes max, meaning I needed to move fast. It took me a whole day of practicing to beat the three-minute mark. I tried it over and over on four different phones and at different times of the day to make sure it'd work under any circumstance. By the end of it, I couldn't bend my fingers. Ouch! Mission one, done. Successfully trained even under time pressure. Mission number two, detect his passcode. I didn't know what his dumb passcode was only that it certainly wasn't our anniversary. We went to the cafe, and as usual, he was stuck on his phone. So I held up mine, pretended to be playing games, but actually turned on the camera, and started recording so I could track the position of his fingers later when typing the passcode. It took hours. Literally. Bryce eventually gave his phone a break to order some snacks. So after that, he had to unlock his phone again. Oof. Finally, after an hour-long video, I've gotten the footage I needed. Okay, Detective Maddie, ready, set, go. I rewatched the video and started analyzing it as soon as I got home. I stared at the screen with my eyes, following Bryce's hand movements. He could be fast, but honey, 
your girl is already a step ahead. It didn't take long till I figured out the digits. Easy peasy. <laughs> Mission 3. Action. What better way than a lovely picnic to complete my quest? And as expected, Bryce just sat there, phone in hand, the whole time. Ugh. I wasn't even sure on how I could carry out this task anymore. But I told myself that the time would surely come. After a few hours, he was bored to death. And without even looking at me, he grumbled. Babe, let's just go home. I immediately shouted out, No! Not until I... Uh, I mean, it's so nice out here. I want to stay a little longer. You just... Take a nap. Fine. Wake me up when you're ready. I waited patiently for him to fall asleep. He was making these light snore sounds. Ugh, cute. I was so nervous. I bit down on my bottom lip as I gently pulled his phone out of his pocket. Then I turned my back to him and typed in the passcode with my shaky hands. And I was in! Yeah! I was so happy that I almost forgot and screamed. I did it all in record time. But he suddenly turned around. What you doing, Maddie? Can we go home now? He yawned. O-M-G. My heart stopped. Uh, oh, just a few more minutes. I'm editing the cute pics we took. Well, hurry up. Phew, that was a close one. I grabbed my phone to check if it worked, then... I turned on the silent mode ASAP, but it still woke him up the second time. As much as I wanted to snoop through his messages, I knew they'd have to wait. So we went home. Ugh! Talk about girl message overload. There were dozens, all of them craftily saved under names such as Monitor and Professor. He'd even used my pickup line on some of them. Are you made of copper and tellarium? Because you're cute. Ew! Then I suddenly spotted a familiar face. Jesse? What? My bestie was secretly dating my BF? My heart sunk. This sucked. It didn't make any sense. If Jessie liked Bryce from the start, then why had she encouraged me to flirt with him? Jeez, the messages between them went way back. Then I saw one that broke my heart all over again. Maddie's family is loaded. Baby, let's pretend to be her BF, and she'll buy you whatever you want. Just don't take it further. So that explained his shyness why he hardly looked at me, and why after two months of dating he hadn't tried to kiss me. Then, a recent message from Bryce to Jessie caught my eye. She's so boring. I got us enough money now, so gonna dump her next week. How dare they! Only, unbeknownst to Jessie, Bryce had dozens of girls on the go. Actually, he was meeting this girl called Tiffany at the movies tomorrow night. It was time to get revenge. So pretending to be Bryce, I texted all of the girls, including Jessie, to come to the cinema at 8 p.m. tomorrow. I borrowed my dad's baseball cap, wore my oversized sunglasses, and arrived there early, so I didn't miss the show. I even bought some popcorn and a Coke, as I wanted refreshments to watch this blockbuster. <laughs> then, at 8 p.m. sharp, Bryce strolled over, and boom! The girls arrived one by one figured out what was going on, and started arguing with him and each other. Tiffany threw her popcorn over his head. Hilarious! And another girl called him a jerk and whacked him with her handbag, while the others were shouting and pulling his hair. And me? Well, I lurked, in the background, and secretly filmed it all. Oh, sweetheart, you're so dead! Wow! Jessie, our main character, has appeared. She took one look at the circus going on in front of her and instantly looked like a lion ready to pounce. She stormed up to Bryce, pinched his ears, and dragged him while in a high-pitched voice he said, Ouch! Ouch! Jess! It's you who taught me all of this! I'll call you later, babes! When these two almost passed me, I pulled off the cap and shades and jumped out at them. Voila! Could someone come and help me pick up their jaws from the floor? <laughs> Couldn't expect Maddie the mastermind, huh? I didn't stick around for their explanations. Instead, I shimmied off.
but I did send her a little souvenir. Hmm, Jessie is my best friend, so I have to share anything interesting with her, right? Have a good night, my bestie, and my ABCDEFGH boyfriend, you too. But let me add the IJK. I'm just kidding. Yeah, as for me, I've decided to give my heart a break for a while, as this has taught me a priceless lesson. Don't be smitten with handsome boys. Oh, and be wary of sneaky so-called besties. All we can do now is pray, the doctor said as he left the room. I looked at Ethan lying on the hospital bed, surrounded by medical equipment, and felt my heart sink. Then Elliot came over to me and said, Charles, I think you should maybe go home and rest. There's nothing you can do right now. Yeah, Elliot was right. Now I had to be stronger than ever, and in fact, if it wasn't for her, I probably wouldn't have made it through this crazy time. Although Elliot was a newbie in our department, We'd become close very quickly, and I was so grateful for her. I smiled at Elliot and offered to drive her home. And then I went to see my mate Cooper. He'd just got back from living abroad. We'd been friends for years. We first met at a gay pride party. He was bisexual and I was gay. At least, I had been. But now, I wasn't so sure. You see, I realized that every time I was with Elliot, my heart was beating faster than usual. Could it be that... I got so lost in my thoughts... I didn't even see Cooper opening the door. He looked at me and said, Dude, what's wrong with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. I told him I was in deep trouble and really needed his advice. Lying on his couch, I explained how my boyfriend Ethan was in hospital, but that I'd started having feelings for a girl. Cooper looked at me with sympathy in his eyes, but then he just nudged me and said, Charles, welcome to my life. It's okay to have feelings for both men and women. It's normal. I asked him what I should do and he said I should just listen to my heart and let it decide. And then he winked at me and asked to see a photo of this girl who was turning me by. I opened my phone and showed him, and he looked shocked. His eyes went wide, and I asked him if he thought she was hot too. But then he said something that made my blood run cold. She's my ex-girlfriend, bro. Whoa, what? This couldn't be happening. Then Cooper told me how they used to date and had even set a wedding date. But then something had happened, and they'd broken up. This was too weird. What were the chances? I wanted to ask him more about what she was like and why they broke up. But from the look on his face, it was too painful to speak about. Plus, it also made me feel a bit uncomfortable. I could barely sleep that night. Worrying about Ethan and thinking about Elliot and Cooper. It was all so strange. The next day, when I was concentrating on my work, my manager suddenly came over and said, Charles, congrats. You're doing so well. I didn't expect one of your team members that you managed to get promoted so quickly. Huh? What was he talking about? No one had been promoted. I was so confused. He noticed how puzzled I looked and said, Didn't you know? Elliot took over Ethan's role as director. What? How did this happen? I looked at him in surprise and he continued. Word on the street is that Elliot is the president's daughter, so it's normal for her to take over. She clearly hid her identity well, didn't she? Then he just laughed and walked off. Wait. If Elliot was the president's daughter, that meant that she was related to Ethan. She was Ethan's sister, right? Oh, this couldn't be. She'd acted like she didn't even know him at the hospital that day. I quickly ran to find her and said, Hey, Elliot, why didn't you tell me you were Ethan's sister? You know that me and your brother are in love. Why would you hide this from me? Elliot just sighed and said, Well, actually, I didn't want to hide this from you. But my parents sent me to help Ethan to run the company. I don't have any experience, so I wanted everyone to treat me like a normal newbie so I could actually learn. That's why I hid my identity. I'm so sorry. I guess she'd done the right thing, as I'd heard lots of gossip behind my back when I'd started dating Ethan. So I sympathized with her. But now it all made sense. The reason I had a crush on Elliot. She looked so similar to Ethan. The same deep blue eyes, the same cheekbones, even the same gestures. She also had the same shrimp allergy and they both had this pen-spinning habit when they're deep in thoughts. How would I not notice this before? What if I wasn't in love with Elliot? I was just in love with how she was so similar to Ethan. Okay, that made me feel a lot better. So it was Ethan I loved after all. The next day I went to visit Ethan with a huge bouquet of sunflowers, his favorite. When I was walking through the entrance, I spotted Cooper. Hey, we meet again. 
I called out. What are you doing here? He told me how he was visiting his ex who'd been in an accident, and I said I was visiting my boyfriend who'd been in an accident. Let's walk together, I said. What room's your ex in? 1502, Cooper said. Are you sure? I mean, that was Ethan's room, I thought. Then it hit me. Hang on, is your ex called Ethan? I asked, really hoping it wasn't. How did you know that? Cooper said. Because Ethan is my boyfriend, I said. This was way too awkward. How was it possible to have this many coincidences? I couldn't believe it. Cooper was shocked too, and said that Ethan was the reason he and Elliot had broken up. He'd fallen in love with Ethan. And Ethan's family had been so upset by this, they kicked Ethan out of the house. Oh, so that's why Ethan never talked to his family and told me to never ask about them. After that mess, unfortunately, their relationship didn't work out. So Cooper packed up his stuff and decided to go study abroad to start things fresh. Oh man, this was a lot to digest. I couldn't help but wonder how Elliot had felt when she'd found out her husband-to-be was in love with her brother. Cooper and I were so shocked, but not as shocked as we were going to be a moment later. We were about to walk into Ethan's room when we heard Elliot's voice. She was speaking in a mean tone, saying, Ethan, you just wait. How will you feel when your boyfriend falls in love with me? It'll be painful, right? I'll make him leave you and it'll serve you right after everything you've done to me. It's time for a taste of your own medicine. I froze when I heard her saying that. I turned to Cooper and he was just as shocked as I was. Suddenly he burst through the door and I stormed in after him. Elliot almost fell off her chair in surprise at seeing us. Um, why, why are you two here together? She said. Hey, stranger, Cooper said. Come on, Elliot, give it up already. It's been a long time. Things were over between us. Just let go and move on. Cooper was so angry, but Elliot just laughed and said, Get over yourself, Cooper. It's not about you. I don't have feelings for you anymore. I just want revenge on my brother. It was so cruel of him to steal you away and ruin my life like that. Then with eyes full of hatred, she turned and looked at poor Ethan lying there. I was furious. I realized exactly what Elliot had been doing. Deliberately flirting with me to steal me away from Ethan. How could she? I confronted her on the spot. What's wrong with you? Why would you treat me like this? And your poor brother? I didn't expect... Before I could continue, though, she interrupted me and said, Charles, wait, listen to me, please. It's true that that was my intention at first, but then I, I fell in love with you. And I thought you were starting to fall for me, too. Uh, I'm so sorry. Elliot then tried to reach for my hand, but I was disgusted. I pushed her away and said, Get away from me. I don't want to see you anymore. Elliot started crying, but I was too upset to be bothered. I was just so horrified that she'd do this. I was so disappointed in myself, too, for falling into her trap. Poor Ethan. He didn't deserve any of this. I stared at him lying there on the hospital bed. What if he knew? I kept staring at him and swear I saw his fingers twitch. Oh my gosh, was he waking up? Cooper quickly went to the doctor while I stayed with Ethan and tried to talk to him. Ethan, Ethan, are you awake? The doctors ran a few tests and said that Ethan had finally regained consciousness and would wake up properly soon. Cooper and I were over the moon. I was so relieved he was going to be okay. And it seemed like Elliot also felt the same as she stood quietly in a corner of the room, tears streaming down her eyes to the corner of her mouth that turned up in the most subtle smile. And as expected, about a week later, Ethan opened his eyes. I'd never been so happy in my life. He started physical therapy, and I spent a lot of time helping him. Of course, Cooper popped in to visit too, and we all had a good laugh about how connected we all were. This must have been real fate, because calling this coincidence would be an understatement. As for Elliot, she just disappeared. But then a few days later, when Ethan, Cooper, and I were chatting together in the hospital, an email popped up on my phone. It was Elliot, and she said she was so sorry for what she'd done, and she just hoped that Ethan and I could forgive her. Then she said she wished us only happiness. I told Ethan and Cooper the good news, and we were all so relieved. Maybe we could all be friends after all. I mean, Elliot might become my sister-in-law one day, right? Life can be so funny. I'm just so glad Cooper appeared when he did, and everything came out into the open. I'd never forgive myself if I'd left Ethan for his sister. Ethan was always the one for me. Hey, I'm Alice, a teenage girl who always dreamed of finding true love. Several months ago, after a lot of failed hope, time, and effort, I started online dating and found my first ever boyfriend. 
we had a sweet, romantic online love story until we decided to meet in real life. So I'll take you back to the beginning. I would not be impatient that much when it came to love if both my besties, Kimmy and Zara, didn't get boyfriends, which made me become the only loner of the group. I had to watch them being all lovey-dovey and calling each other weird names like Baby Boo and Cuddly Bear. Yuck. Even if the boys weren't around, they would still drive me crazy talking about their sweet guys all the time. Worse still, when I told them to stop being so obsessed, they immediately insisted on pestering me to find a boyfriend. Ridiculous! I didn't need a boyfriend. I was doing just fine without one. Yeah, right. Who was I trying to kid? Deep down inside, I really wanted somebody by my side who I could be all cringy and lovey-dovey with. My two besties could probably read my mind and took action, and they set up some dates for me. The first was with this boy from school. He looked pretty cute on our first date, and he took me to this nice restaurant. A good start, isn't it? However, he talked about his mother for literally the entire time. Everything in sight reminded him of her, her favorite foods, how perfectly she made her spaghetti sauce, how politely she would react on the table. In the end, I suggested he go and date his mother instead, as he was clearly obsessed with her. Yeah, that didn't go down well. The next date was with this college boy. I fantasized a million times about a romantic, cozy, and sweet date with him, because, you know, it was the middle of winter. But no. He turned up late, and when I asked him where we were going, he shrugged and said, wherever. By this point, I was freezing and hungry, so I suggested we go get something to eat. But he told me he had no money and would just watch me eat. I offered to buy him a drink so we could at least sit inside somewhere, but he refused. So we ended up sitting in silence on a bench in the park. I ended up slurping on my hot chocolate just for entertainment. When I got home, I felt super sorry for myself. I was so tired of meetings and wasting time on those idiots. There must be an easier, more possible, and warmer way to find one. So I downloaded a dating app. I'm not a complete idiot. I know that internet dating is risky, so I didn't post any pics of my face. Just a landscape picture with a movie quote written on it. And I used a different name, Daisy. The matches started coming in, but it wasn't hard to weed out the fakes. There was even a man using a fake account to try and find out if his daughter was using it. Delete, delete, delete. I was about to give up and accept that I'd be single and alone forever. This online world was exactly like what I'd read about it. All lies. I'd just have to get some cats or something for company. But then, this guy messaged me saying he liked the movie quotes I used. Impressive. So I messaged him back. I found out that this Roger guy had the same movie taste as me, and he even lived in the same neighborhood. We got on so well, so we chatted way past midnight. It seemed like we had everything in common, from favorite pizza toppings to top celebrities. He even shared his love of electronic dance music. And once I tried hearing his recommended playlist, I was immediately completely hooked on it. Wow, this guy seemed interesting so I decided to flirt it up and see if he had a sense of humor. I mean, I had to create opportunities for myself, right? So I wrote, Hey Roger, I enjoy chatting with you. Do you know what I would do if I could change the alphabet? He replied, No, what would you do? I would put you and I together, so I could talk to you more. Then he sent me lots of heart icons and said, You're so funny. Actually, you don't need to change the alphabet, because I also desire to know if there is any other way for me to talk to you. Chatting to this boy had cheered me up, so I sent him my Facebook link. I stayed cautious, so I sent him my clone account, which I sometimes used for sharing cool posts and commenting on pages. Moments later, I got a friend request from Roger. I checked his wall and found out a little more info about him, such as he went to the same high school as me two years ago and he played soccer because there were some field photos. There were no pictures of his face, but that was fine. Those real life photos could tell me more about him. The thought of having a cute, sporty boyfriend really made me excited. I smiled as I walked out of my room to go to the bathroom. Then I bumped into my older brother, Sam. Get out of my way, potato head. He taunted me as usual but he had this weird grin on his face. Why are you so happy? I asked him. Never mind. 
he replied, while whistling and walking off. Had this weirdo just stuck some stupid note on my back? But, well, I was in a great mood and wouldn't let this childish bro bother me. I couldn't wait until morning to tell Kimmy and Zara about Roger. They were so excited and said the way I'd found him was like something out of a movie. They kept imagining how our new love story would be, and I had to admit that I began to daydream too. Roger and I messaged each other every night. He was always a great listener, and I could confide in him without feeling shy or anything. It wasn't long before he was always on my mind. I also sent random pictures to him throughout the day of my alien doodles, my shoes, my lunch, and so on. I even got a detention in math class for daydreaming about him. Oh wait, was I in love? I wondered if he felt the same about me. And the fateful day arrived. He sent me a message that both excited and terrified me. He wanted to hear my voice. Okay, so this meant he wanted to voice call or video call. What if he thought I sounded too squeaky? Or what if he thought I was ugly? So I decided to only open the camera when I turned off my room lights. Ironically, Roger did the same. He said he had to pretend like he was sleeping so that his sister wouldn't come in and interrupt our convo. Aw, he must be a sweet big brother whom his little girl could always count on. So, yeah, now we'd upgraded from texting to video calls. My feelings for him increased a bit more every day. He always sensed my mood and cheered me up, regardless of how lame my problem seemed. One time, I was annoyed because my parents told me off for forgetting to do my chores. It was not that big a deal. I cried to him on the phone, and he told me it was okay, and that his sister always forgot to do her chores too. So sometimes, he had to help her. God, he was so nice. Roger's sister was so lucky to have a big brother like him. Unlike my brother, who always sat back and sniggered whenever I got in trouble. Comparing them made me feel self-pity and cry even harder, until a point that he frantically blurted out, Listen, Daisy, I like you. Don't cry, because it hurts me so bad that I can't be there for you. I just want to meet you as soon as possible. Oh my god, was he serious? Did this mean he was asking me to be his girlfriend? At first, I was thrilled, but right after that, I started to worry. What if he didn't like the way I looked? Besides, when he'd found out I'd used a clone account to talk to him, would he be angry with me? I needed advice, so I turned to my besties. They told me to go and meet him, as this way, I'd know if he was serious about me or not. If he liked the real me, he would hear me out, without getting mad. I arranged to meet Roger in the park, and we both agreed to both wear something red for easy recognition. So I went for a red dress and red headband combo. Cute! I checked my phone a zillion times to make sure he hadn't cancelled. I also prepared as best I could by practicing my smile in the mirror and by doing a last-minute nail polish change-up. Yeah, I know, I was a slave to love. Ugh, I hated lovey-dovey couples, but look at me now! We arranged to meet by the flower garden in the park, the perfect location for a daisy. On the way, I had mixed feelings. I was both excited about seeing my online boyfriend for the first time and also worried. I mean, what if he didn't like me? As I arrived, I saw the back of a guy who was wearing a red hoodie. That must be him. Um, what should I do now? Okay, so I took a deep breath, then walked up behind him and timidly said, um, hi, Roger. Is that you? He turned around, and to my shock, I saw that it was Sam, my dearest brother. Alice, what are you doing here? He asked. What? I'm here to meet my online boyfriend. What about you? I raised an eyebrow. Me too. I mean, I'm meeting a girl. My girlfriend, Daisy. He flustered out. Are you? R Roger? I spluttered out and ended up biting my tongue in the process. Ouch! There was this awkward silence as we both stood there letting the awful truth soak in. Ugh! I swear it was weird to think back on our messages and talking before. I got goosebumps at the thought of my brother's sweet words earlier. I couldn't take this anymore, so I muttered out something about going home and walked off.
but I wasn't paying attention and walked straight into the flower garden and ended up trampling on the flowers, which received disapproving tuts from an onlooker. Oops, I couldn't really go home. It was way too embarrassing. So I wandered aimlessly around the park. Can you guys imagine it? The boy that had filled my dreams for the last two months turned out to be my brother. Now I knew why we had so many things in common. Because we were siblings. It started getting dark, but I was still in the park, sitting on a bench and wondering when my life turned into such a mess. Then Sam messaged me saying, Where are you? Come back home. I replied, No way! I don't want to see your face ever again! He replied, That's not what you said earlier. Trust him to make a joke out of this, but nothing about this situation was funny. Ugh! I replied, This is all your fault. I'm never coming home. Ever! Then he messaged back, Stop being overdramatic. I told mom you went to Kimmy's. Come home for dinner now. I didn't want to go home, but it was freezing out here, and I guess I was feeling hungry. Why could Sam be all warm and well-fed while I was cold and miserable? I arrived home to see Sam sitting at the dinner table. I tried my best to avoid eye contact with him, but I ended up turning into a clumsy oaf and dropped a forkful of pasta on my lap. That was so gonna stain. Sam stood up and brought me a tissue box, which made me feel way more awkward. My parents must have found it odd that Sam and me weren't arguing for once, so Mom said, You two seem to love each other for once, huh? She was just joking, but I could feel my face turning red. I glanced at my brother, and he seemed even more embarrassed than me. As awkward as it was, we needed to talk to clear the air. So, after dinner, I messaged him to meet me outside, and we went for a walk. Finally, I broke the silence. Listen, I know this is the most awkward thing ever. I thought I loved Roger, but now that I know he's you, well, I don't feel the same anymore. He replied, Yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I agree with you on the feelings and stuff. I mean, you're my annoying sister. Who knew we had so much in common? But I guess it makes sense, as I taught you all the cool stuff you know. He grinned. So, are we cool? I looked at him. Yeah, we're cool, Potato Head. He grinned, as he knocked my head, and then in a taunting voice added, Hey, what do you think you were doing going online to find a boyfriend? You could have met a serial killer. I grimaced. You online dated too, and instead of a serial killer, I have met a guy who pretends to be a cool big brother, huh? It wasn't all lies. I do help you with your chores, or else you must get kicked out of our house for your laziness. He laughed. Sorry, bro, I've never seen that. You should do it more often. I sneered as I play hit his arm. We both looked at each other and then burst out laughing. So, this is my story. Pretty awkward, huh? Thankfully, my brother and I are now back to normal. Ovs, neither of us have mentioned it to each other since. As for true love, well, I hope my time will come, but I'm in no hurry to go looking for it. Online dating is not for me. I have to admit, it is kind of funny thinking back on it. I mean, if one day in the future my children ask me about my first love, would I have to answer them, it was your Uncle Sam? Um, yeah. I don't think I'll be telling them that. I've never liked hospitals. Yeah, I get it, no one really does. Yet here I was sitting in the hospital waiting area, silently praying that she would be all right. Geez, I was shaking like an old dog left out in the cold. I just couldn't think straight. Why was no one telling me if she would be okay? Suddenly, a stern-faced doctor appeared and told me, Sir, the operation was a success. Your sister will be just fine. You can go through and see her now. I didn't know whether to burst into tears because of relief or to run away because of fear. Finally, I still went to see her. She blinked open her eyes, then fixed them on me, and in a groggy voice said, Who are you? I get it. My appearance unnerves people. I've never been a looker, and this scar sure doesn't help. 
but people will always judge. Maybe if they stop to talk to me, then I can tell them that I'm a military veteran who got it due to an accident during training. Training I was doing so I could fight to save their butts. Anyway, that's a story for another day. Now, talking about the girl in the hospital, let me continue my story. Well, it began with my evening shift as a delivery driver. I was humming along to the radio when this girl came out of nowhere and ran straight into the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes, but it was too late. I heard a thud. She was lying there all limp. It was horrible. For a moment, I thought she was dead, and I was too scared to check on her. Suddenly, a thought of abandoning her popped up in my mind. But no, I couldn't be that heartless, so I ran to check her pulse. Phew, she was still alive. I called for an ambulance and told her help was on the way. In the hospital, the doctor said she needed emergency surgery, but they had to have a relative's consent first. The girl had no ID on her or anything. What was I meant to do? I couldn't just sit there and let her die. So I blurted out, I give my permission, I'm her brother. When the girl asked me who I was, well, I had no idea how to reply. The doctor concluded that she must have memory loss. So, who are you? The girl asked me again. I couldn't go changing my story now, so I replied, I'm Chelvin, your brother. Oh, hi Chelvin, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. This girl seemed so sweet, I instantly warmed to her. It's been just me and my dog Buster for I don't know how many years. Girls usually take one look at me and run away as fast as their heeled shoes can take them. But this girl wasn't looking at me like they did. The doctors asked me what her name was, so I said Alice. That was my mother's name. Before I even knew what I was doing, I'd use my savings to pay for her hospital fees. Then I visited her every day. I thought she'd ask me about her family, friends, I don't know, everything. But nope. She just liked listening to me ramble on, mainly about Buster. When she was ready to leave the hospital, I took her back to my house. I made up the spare room and bought some new bed covers, laid some clothes out on the bed, and put some flowers in there to make it look nice. Alice seemed to like it. She smiled, told me I was sweet, then hugged me. I bet I was blushing like a beetroot. I left her there to get ready. Then I made a start on dinner. She came downstairs in this dress I'd bought at the mall for her, and oh my days, she looked like a picture. I made an excuse to go and get her a drink, so she wouldn't see how flustered I was. I thought she'd ask me stuff about her life, but she didn't. Not one question. So I decided to tell her anyway. I mean, I'd spent days making the backstory up, so I may as well share it with her. It's just you and me now, and it has been that way for a long time. Our parents passed away some years ago now. Our mom, she was called Alice too. Oh, it's a nice name, she muttered back. Do I look like her? Um, yes, you have her hair. I told her a few other things, such as how she'd just broken up with her boyfriend and was in between homes at the moment. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like she was soaking my words in and taking some comfort from them. The next day, things changed, and Alice started doing erratic things. I went downstairs bright and early to find that she'd emptied all of my kitchen cupboards and was scrubbing them clean. When I asked her what she was doing, she ignored me and carried on. It's like she was in her own bubble and couldn't hear me at all. I told myself this was probably just her way of adjusting to everything. But then her odd behavior continued. When a delivery guy knocked on the door, she leaped behind the couch. Afterward, I asked her what was up. But she said she was just looking for her lost earring. Another time, I was waiting for my favorite TV show to start, and we were both chatting on the couch, but she suddenly grabbed the TV remote, turned it off, then walked out of the room with the remote. This was normal, right? She'd been through a lot. Maybe this was a stage of her recovery? Most of the time, she was such a sweet and lovely girl. She always packed food and snacks for me to take to work, and she made such a fuss of Buster. Okay, so she still did her cupboard cleaning ritual every single morning, but hey, we all have our quirks. Having another mouth to feed meant I had to work more hours, but I didn't mind it. For once, I felt like a purpose. She helped me find the reason to live again, instead of just existing. I often took her treats home, such as cookies or Hawaiian pizza, her favorites. If I was working night shifts, she always waited up for me. 
It made me feel so warm inside when I arrived home and saw her sitting there with Buster. I had no money left at the end of each month, but I had something more. I had happiness. I liked this girl. I more than liked her, but I couldn't tell her this, as she thought I was her brother. I knew I needed to tell her the truth, but I just didn't know how to go about doing so. One morning, after she'd finished her cupboard cleaning and we were enjoying breakfast, I told her about the job I had on, delivering a parcel to Sherry Hill Street. Her eyes widened. Then she told me she wanted to come too. This was surprising, as she'd shown no interest in leaving the house before. I mean, she refused to even take Buster for a walk, but I agreed without questioning her. I told her to wait in the lorry while I delivered the parcel. Only when I got back, she wasn't there. I ran around the block searching for her, but then I saw a crowd and it seemed like there's a car accident. My face paled. I ran as fast as I could to see who the victim was and luckily it wasn't her. Phew. I kept looking around and finally I found her. She was sitting on the curb with her head in her hands. She was crying. I sat down next to her and hugged her. She might be too scared witnessing the terrible accident. Then, when she was ready, I took her home. The next morning, I went downstairs expecting to see her cleaning the cupboards, but she wasn't there. I made her some toast and a coffee and took them up to her room. She opened the door, glared at me, then said, I remember everything. I know you're not my brother. Alice, I'm so sorry. I just, I just wanted to help you. She shouted at me. My name's not even Alice. Then she stormed past me. I rushed after her and heard the door bang shut. She'd gone. So that's it. I was back to my lonely, sad life. Each day after work, I came home to see no one waiting for me. No hot meals, no laugh, nothing but a boring, empty house. Three months went by, and one day I was delivering some boxes to this rich shop owner guy. The boxes were very heavy, and one of them fell out of my arms and hit the floor. The shop guy started yelling at me, You idiot! I'm not paying you to be neglectful! But then what do I expect? You can't even look after your own face. I didn't say anything. Instead, I peered down at my feet. Then I heard footsteps. So I looked up and there she was. It was Alice. Oh no, I didn't want her to see me being scorned at like this. Suddenly she shouted at the man. Hey, just because you have money doesn't mean you can say anything to others. Apologize to him or I will not let up on you. The man sneered and told her to go away. I couldn't deal with this, so I walked away. But Alice rushed after me and called out to me. Please, Chelvin, let me tell you the truth. I stopped walking, and that's when she told me everything. It turns out she'd never lost her memory. She faked it because she wanted to escape her miserable life. Her husband was a cruel man who cheated on her, beat her, and controlled her. He was a famous TV presenter, which is why she turned off the TV that time, as she'd seen him on there. She hid when the doorbell rang, as she was terrified it'd be him, and she tidied the cupboard every morning out of habit, as if she didn't do it back home, he would beat her. What? This was crazy. I needed answers. So I asked her, so you faked regaining your memories? And that outburst, it was all a lie? Chelvin, I'm so sorry. I knew I couldn't drag you into my personal life anymore. I used to live in Sherry Hill Street. That's why I came with you. I found out my husband thought I was dead, so he married another woman. I made him sign the divorce papers and set me free. I also made him give me a payout, else I'd ruin his precious career. Then she handed me some money and told me it was to cover the expenses for when she was living with me, and that she'd also send me some money to cover her hospital fees. We hugged, and I cried like a baby. Gee, this was all too much for me. But then, to my surprise, she grinned, went to shake my hand, then said, Hey, I'm Julia. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, after that, thanks to her ex, Julia was able to buy a nice little house. Actually, I'm helping her renovate it. We've become pretty great friends. To be honest, just looking at her makes my stomach flip. I love her so much. I know I need to tell her. Life's far too short not to. If she says no, well, then at least I'll still have her friendship, right? I might not have model looks, but I'm a good person. Julia's taught me to realize that. I hope she says yes, but what will be, will be. Wish me luck.
In every high school boy's story, there's always a drop-dead gorgeous girl who makes him do stupid things to try to win the girl over, right? Well, my story is pretty much along those lines, except I was competing with a dog. Yeah, you heard me. Here we go. So my name's Liam, and I'm 17. And Suzanne is the girl I was chasing. I remember the first time I laid eyes on her. It was during a football match at school, and she was one of the cheerleaders. Her bouncy blonde locks and her bright blue eyes drove me crazy, and I couldn't take my eyes off her. In other words, I was smitten, so that's when I started my pickup plan. I paid my friend $10 to find out her address and her favorite food. Stalk her much? <laughs> well, this was only the beginning. Once I had her address, I walked up to her house holding a strawberry cheesecake with a love letter attached to it. I peeked over the fence and was about to put the cake on the doorstep, ring the doorbell, and run away. But as I was walking towards the door, a dog appeared and jumped towards me. I freaked out and tried to run away, but instead I face-planted in the ground and, of course, the cake landed right next to me and the letter flew away. What a disaster. Plus, the damn dog kept biting at my pants. Meanwhile, I was screaming like a little kid. And guess who appeared at that moment? None other than Suzanne. Noticing the cake and the letter with her name on it, she smiled down at me, helped me up, and said she had a first aid kit inside. She said her dog, Loki, just got excited when he saw new people. And then she kept apologizing, but I told her it was okay. And to be honest, I'd fall down like that every day if it meant I got to be helped up by Suzanne. After that, we started texting, although most of the time she was sending me photos of Loki. Finally, after a few months of texts, I plucked up the courage to ask her out on a proper date, and it was amazing. After dropping her off at her front door, I decided that that was the moment to confess my feelings and ask her to be my girlfriend. I was shaking so much that I almost forgot to breathe, but luckily she told me she liked me too. Then suddenly she grabbed me and planted a big kiss on my cheek, and so I held her and decided to go in for a proper kiss on the lips. But out of nowhere, Loki appeared and leapt on me and I fell flat on my face. Not again! And this time I was furious. I sat up and I was about to go crazy. But then I noticed Suzanne was laughing. Loki seems to like you, she joked. He's driving me insane, but seeing how happy she was made my anger all gone. I was about to stand up and go in for a kiss again, but Loki kept pulling Suzanne inside. She had no choice but to follow him. So I was left there all alone. Man. What was that dog's problem? After that night, I refused to go to Suzanne's house when we met up. I even told her I thought her dog hated me, and she thought that that was hilarious. She then said he was just protective, and then she shared the story of why they adopted him. So when I was eight, my best friend lived next door. His name was Andrew, and Loki was his pet. The three of us were so close, but one day Andrew's parents got divorced, and Andrew moved to Canada with his dad. So he left Loki with me. It's been nine years since we saw each other. A thought crossed my mind. Maybe Loki hated me because he thought Suzanne was Andrew's girlfriend. No way. He was just a dog, right? And the trouble was never ending. Prom night arrived, and Suzanne was so excited. I made sure I got to her house early and waited her for a while while she did her hair and stuff. I told her I'd wait outside, but she insisted I come in. I was dreading seeing Loki, but of course there he was, waiting for me by the couch with a smirk on his face. I mean, come on, since when did dogs smirk? I sat there nervously watching him, but after Suzanne had gone back upstairs, he came over to me with a photo in his mouth. It was Suzanne sitting next to a boy, and Loki was there too. Obviously, it was Andrew in the photo, and they looked so happy together. Why was Loki showing me this? I looked Loki straight in the eyes and said, Listen up, Loki. Andrew and Suzanne aren't together. Suzanne is my girlfriend, so just leave us alone, okay? Loki just kept staring at me, then he left. It was clear I'd lost the plot. There I was threatening a dog. <laughs> After a while, Suzanne came downstairs, and we were about to leave. But I couldn't find my shoes anywhere. After 30 minutes of looking, we still couldn't find them. And by then, Suzanne was pretty upset with me. She ran upstairs and locked herself in her room. I didn't know what to do, so I got up to leave barefoot. When I got outside, I noticed Loki smirking again. But I wasn't in the mood to care about him now. Suddenly, I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around and it was Loki with my shoes in his mouth. He dropped them at my feet and then ran off. I couldn't believe it. That stupid dog stole my shoes and ruined our night. I spent the next week texting Suzanne trying to apologize and eventually she forgave me. But I still hate Loki so much. He was seriously making my life a living nightmare. During the summer, Suzanne was going to Chicago with her parents to visit her aunt. So she asked me to look after Loki for two weeks. What? 
You've got to be kidding me. I had no choice but to agree. If I said no, I'd risk losing Suzanne. So when I went to pick him up, I saw him standing there smirking at me again. It looked like he was saying, Oh, hey, Liam, are you ready for two weeks of hell with me? The worst part was all the instructions Suzanne had for me about how to take care of her precious Loki. Feed him with organic dog food three times a day in his special bowl. Then make sure he gets two walks a day, no less than five miles each time. And every night at 6 p.m. he needs his bath with his doggy bubble bath. He likes to be massaged behind the ears. And please read him a bedtime story to ensure he has sweet dreams. Uh, This had to be some kind of joke. How would I remember all of that? And as expected from day one, it was a total disaster. It was summer vacation. So I wasn't going to bed early. In fact, I was playing video games with my friends all night. So I never managed to wake up at 6 a.m. to feed him. And surely he wouldn't die if he skipped a meal, right? But well, he didn't give me much choice. He leapt onto my bed at 6.30 a.m. licking my face and demanding food. Another time I was going to my friend's house, so obviously I couldn't take him with me. So before leaving I said, hey Loki, be a good boy, I'll be back soon. Then I smirked and locked the door. Loki started barking, so I knew he was angry. Well, it served him right. However, when I got home that night, I discovered he peed all over my clothes and messed up my entire room. He'd clearly done this to get revenge, and I was fuming. I started yelling at him as I was cleaning up the mess. And that's when I realized that I'd have to take him everywhere with me. Even though he was super annoying, I started to understand why Suzanne loved him. He was smart, affectionate, and I guess it's kind of nice to have company. When I was watching movies alone, he would come over and lay in my lap. When I played video games, I could ask him to bring me snacks. And once I went to the toilet and realized the loo roll was finished, and I shouted, Loki, can you please get me some loo roll? And he actually brought me one. A few days later, we were out walking in the park, and I saw some boys playing basketball. I was desperate to join them, so I told Loki to wait for me. But after the match, he was nowhere to be seen. I freaked out and frantically searched the whole park, but it was hopeless. Suzanne would never forgive me if I lost her precious Loki. So the next day, I put up some flyers hoping someone had found him. Well, luckily for me, someone called me and said they had found him. I immediately went to get him and waited outside the address they'd given me, which was in a kind of dodgy part of town. While I was waiting, two men dressed in black clothes approached me. They looked suspicious, so I tried to step out of the way, but one of them grabbed my arm and said, Give us your money, otherwise you might get hurt. I started struggling and trying to get away, but this made them even angrier. I freaked out when suddenly I heard a familiar barking. Loki! He was rushing towards us and started biting at the robber's clothes, pulling them away from me. I was so relieved and after a while, the robbers ran off, scared half to death. I gave Loki the biggest hug and he was wagging his tail in delight. Then a woman with a dog came towards us. Turns out she was the person who had called me. She'd been walking her dog Penny in the park when Loki had started following them and wouldn't leave Penny alone. He'd been smitten with her, so Penny's owner didn't know what to do and took Loki home. Eventually, she saw the posters, and that's when she'd contacted me. Ha! Huh, so Loki was as bad as me, chasing a pretty girl. How funny. When we got home, I thanked Loki again for saving me. Then I said, You know Andrew doesn't live here anymore, right? He's in Canada, which is far away. But listen, I love Suzanne so much, and I know you do too. So we'll take care of her together, okay? He kept staring at me like he was waiting for something more. So then I said, Oh, right. Yeah. If you agree... I promise I'll take you to Penny's house to visit her. Deal? I reached out my hand to shake his, and he legit put his paw in my hand. Okay, done deal. A few days later, Suzanne got back and picked up Loki. And when I told Suzanne everything that had happened, she burst out laughing. After that, our relationship got even better, and we started hanging out with Loki more. Although whenever I wanted to kiss her, I always said to Loki, Hey bro, look away. And he never once tried to interfere again. Loki and I are on good terms now as he's in love with Penny, as I am with Suzanne. It's true what they say, boys go wild for pretty girls. Hi, Melanie here, and I am hanging on the edge of my seat to hear the results of this year's science fair. I know I might not look like a typical studious girl, but I'm definitely serious about school. Ooh, one second. The winner of West High Science Fair 2023 is Harry Silver. That means the runner-up is Melanie D'Angelo. Congratulations to you both. Please come onto the stage for your awards. Man, I can't believe I'm second to him again. 
We'd been literally swapping first and second place on every leaderboard since we were kids. Ugh, so unfair. Look at him. All he did was partying and pulling silly pranks, yet he's still on the honor roll, while I had to study day and night to maintain my straight A's. Mmm, mom's taking quite long. What's that commotion over there? This calls for a celebration. What do you guys think? Olive Garden? Yes! Jeez, can you keep it down just a smidge? Come to think of it, people like Harry just have it all, while I only have mom by my side. Oh, she came just in time! Dad left us for another woman a while ago, so my mom had been struggling every day being a single mom. She must be really sad and lonely, so I'd never mention Dad anymore. Poor her. The more I felt for mom, the angrier I was at dad. Only my bestie, Izzy, knew about this, cause, you know, it's hard to open up when you're from a broken home. Luckily, there's one thing in this world that could raise my spirits, as well as my heartbeat, in these dark, gloomy days. My dreamy crush, Cameron. Last year of middle school was coming to an end, so I gotta make a move with Cameron fast. The problem was, every time I got close to him, that party pooper appeared out of nowhere to make fun of me. He kept calling me melanin, cause that's what you lack, and bothered me nonstop. We had never gotten along, but seriously? What's wrong with him lately? He picked on me way too much, and why only me? I can't believe everyone thinks he's a model student. To me, Harry's no more than the most annoying bug. All right, hair, makeup, pearly white teeth, check. I'm giving it another go today, waiting for Cameron at his locker with my love letter in hand. As soon as I saw his gorgeous face, I took a deep breath, then put up the sweetest smile, but all of a sudden, someone messed up my hair from behind. Ouch! I turned around to see the culprit. Harry! You look hot. And it generates electricity, too. Now you can charge your phone with your hair. Thank me later. <laughs> oh my god! Nobody should see this Medusa hairdo! My plan to confess failed again before it even started. All thanks to that clown Harry. Wait, isn't that my dad? He was walking out of the principal's office with a much younger woman and a boy my age. From what I gathered, they're saying that his son would go here. Seeing how my dad's starting a new life with his new family, I couldn't help but feel sorry for mom. This is all that woman's fault. If she just disappeared, things could go back to the way they were. But that's merely a wish, and me and mom just have to put up with this boring, unhappy life day by day. Voodoo for dummies? Was some higher power listening to me? This sounds like an answer to my problem. I ordered the book immediately. I started studying all kinds of spells and rituals in it as soon as the package arrived. Voodoo dolls? Interesting. The next day, I went to find Izzy ASAP. Hey, I'm thinking of using a voodoo doll on my dad's new wife to bring my parents back together. What do you think? Does it really work? I don't think. Yo, Wednesday. Sorry. <clears throat> Yo, knock off Wednesday. <laughs> Harry Silver, you are so dead. But wait a second. You know what? We can test it out. Harry would be the perfect guinea pig. What? Him? He's just being his playful self. What if voodoo actually works? Harry doesn't deserve it. Well, I don't think so. Let's make a doll for our little preppy boy then. Crocheting a doll's easy, however the tricky thing was getting my subject's hair, and you bet I won't get physically close to Harry even if someone pays me to. So I got this, a Ouija board. It will help me figure out the code for his locker. There must be a few strands stuck on the fancy hairbrush that he kept inside. Ugh, but none of the combos worked! This is the tenth time already! How about this? There we go, but there were only books inside. Ah, uh, boring. Then the soccer team's changing room it is. I will definitely find something on his uniform. Let's see. Harry, silver, there it is. Aha, gotcha. I was about to flee the scene when I suddenly saw a boy with only a towel around his waist. Ah! I sprinted to the door and dashed straight through the hallway. That was close. Okay, I still had a voodoo doll to finish. And it's done. I excitedly show Izzy last night's work. Pretty good, huh? It has Harry's hair too. What? How do you know it's really Harry's? What if it's somebody else's? Well, I... Hey, did you hear some perv with panda eyes was creeping around the boys' changing room yesterday? Go away. But don't worry. Starting today, we'll take turns guarding the entrance to catch them. Oh, what a coincidence. You fit the culprit's description perfectly, melanin. But you're definitely not that pervy, are you? <laughs> I was so mad, I felt smoke coming out of my ears. I wish my gaze could kill that rat. 
No, you're squeezing the doll's arm. It's gonna come off. Whoops, my bad. Next time I saw Harry, he had bandages all over his right arm. Hang on, did I do that? Feeling guilty and curious, I approached him. Hey, what's wrong with your arm? It's been in pain since yesterday for no reason. My doctor said nothing's wrong, but I kept feeling like someone's squeezing it really hard. Ugh, there it goes again. Oh, spooky. It means the doll is truly magical. I immediately came running to tell Izzy, and of course, she was shocked too. But hold up, nosy, arty? How long has he been standing here? This guy clearly had heard everything. He kept reaching for my doll. No way, he'd tell the whole school about it. Then suddenly, Harry sat down next to me. Melanie, my arm hurts. Feed me. Ah. Uh... What's he pulling now? Can't he see I'm in the middle of something? Right at that moment, Artie snatched my doll. Leave it to me. No, Artie, no, not with milk in his mouth. Oops, sorry, I felt so nauseous all of a sudden. That was more than enough to make all of us firm believers. But maybe I should stop. I do feel guilty for dragging Harry into this. That afternoon, when I was about to throw the doll in the trash can, I saw Cameron walk towards me. Did Christmas come early? Hey, I was wondering if you're... Yes, I've been waiting so long for this day. An occultist? What? I mean, Artie was going off about a voodoo doll of yours, so I thought you might know a thing or two about love spells. But if that's not true, I'm sorry. Um, what do you need a love spell for? Then he revealed he wanted to put a spell on his crush, Regina. So all this time, I had no chance with him at all? But hey, a love spell sounds like a brilliant idea. It could ensure my parents' reunion too. Sure thing, but I'll need your hair as well as Regina's. Also, some of your personal items for the spell to work. Obviously, I'll use his stuff, but in a love spell for me. And you know what I gave him? It's all junk with some of my poodle's fur. <laughs> a few days later, I found a gift box in my locker from Cameron. My spell worked. I'm about to have a boyfriend and reunite my family. But before I could carry out that long-awaited plan, Artie came to me with a difficult request, making a voodoo doll of Brad, some transfer student who already established himself as a vicious tough guy. That sounds dangerous, and I already promised myself not to use voodoo anymore. Don't believe me? See for yourself. Then, I followed him and witnessed another student being picked on by a much bigger guy. Hey, isn't he dad's stepson? Okay, this Brad guy deserves it. So I agreed to help Artie. The next day, I approached Brad after class where he usually messed with other students. I managed to sneak up behind him and get one strand of hair. Oh no, busted. I quickly put the hair in the doll. This better work. Come on, why isn't it working? And why now? Pesky little thing. Stop. Stop. I know those voices. Thank goodness. Touch her and you'll regret it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call the police. Brad just scoffed and left. Phew, what are you both doing here? And Harry, I thought your arm hurt. Then Harry and Izzy finally told me that voodoo had never been effective. Izzy knew that Harry only picked on me because he liked me? That's why she tried to stop me from using voodoo on him. But she couldn't, so she then told Harry everything. To be honest, I found your attempts quite amusing, so I acted like they were successful to humor you and myself. I was gonna stop though, but when you were being sweet to me and ask about my arm, I decided to keep it up. Oh. My. God. My bestie had been friends with my mortal enemy all along. Behind my back? Am I a joke to you? Why are you here? To make fun of me even more than you already did? Because I got worried when I heard you're going after Brad. Melanie, you're the smartest girl in school. I don't understand why you're doing all these dumb gimmicks. Yeah, you've been acting strange lately. Since when are you superstitious? What other choice do I have? Voodoo or at whatever cost? I need to get my parents back together. And that punk Brad is my dad's stepson. He deserves whatever comes to him for ruining my life. And you know what else? Both of you get out of my sight for good. Then I stormed off. After that day, I no longer talked to Izzy and Harry's relentless pestering finally stopped. But honestly, it felt a bit empty without them, especially with the upcoming school field trip. Of course, I'm still coming. Who needs them anyway? This is the chance for Cameron and I to be closer now that we're talking on the regs. It's gonna be the best trip ever. I've never been the outdoorsy type, but does camping involve this many physical tasks? Almost done. What on earth is that? Isn't he under my love spell already? I mean, he even gave me a present. I was still in shock when Cameron came over to help with the tent. Thank you. No need to. I can't thank you enough. That spell of yours worked wonders. What does he mean by that? 
Then, out of nowhere, Izzy tapped on my shoulder. I've tried to tell you. Those two have been flirting for a while now. I guess Cameron just needed your spell as a little spiritual push. That means none of these has ever worked? There's absolutely no hope of bringing my family back? Feeling devastated, I burst into tears and ran off. I was running without looking and bumped into... Brad? Melanie, right? Just who I want to see. Or should I say, my dear stepsister, your mama sent you here. Let go of me and piss off! <laughs> I wonder how pathetic she had to be to have her husband walk out on her. <laughs> if this was any other time, I would have fought back. But after all that just happened, I've lost all of my will to do anything now. Out of the blue, I saw someone charge at Brad and land a brutal blow on his face. I said I'd make you regret touching her. I had to stop Harry before he messed Brad's face up beyond recognition. It's time we got out of here. Why did you come help me after everything I said? I'm kinda used to your coldness. Besides, my love language is following you around and teasing you until you notice or get mad at me. Silly. I know. On a different note, I thought you knew that voodoo was useless. Yeah, so I thought of a love spell to get my parents back together. Then my family will be whole and happy again. But I know it now. There's no such thing as magic. Why not? Magic is alive and well inside you, and it is called forgiving. It cannot punish those who hurt you and your loved ones, but it can help you let go of your pains and sufferings. What are you trying to say? I mean, no magic can make your dad come back, but someday the pain he caused you won't ache anymore. Eventually, your mom and you will heal and lead a fulfilling life without him. I never took this goofy guy for the philosophical and mature type, but I guess he's right. I've been so caught up in my own bitterness that I didn't realize moving on was an option. When my mom picked me up, I decided to finally ask her about my dad. Unexpectedly, mom told me that of course it was sad at first, but she's actually doing fine these days. Life's supposed to have its ups and downs. As long as we welcome them with open arms, everything will turn out all right in the end. After all, your father will have the life he wants while we get on with our lives. Turned out, I was the only one chasing the past all this time when what I actually needed was closure. Mom's words were more than enough to put this grieving period behind me. My last year as a middle schooler was quite eventful. Brad was no longer a problem since he got a taste of Harry's fist. Did I mention that we became a trio of best friends? For now, at least. Harry never stopped his shenanigans, but instead of getting annoyed like before, I found him quite adorable and endearing. Oh, just kiss already? Izzy! I was tidying up my room when a call came through. Oh, my big sister! She lives with mom, so I've not seen her in a year. Blair! It's been a hot minute! How have you been? Hi, Karenin. Well, not so good. Mom laughed. Oh no! What happened? Then Blair told me it's due to mom's debts. She had run away from the loan sharks and left my sister behind. That's awful! So I told her to come to Portland and live with us. She agreed to come, but then I realized that Blair staying here wasn't really down to me. Oh well, it's not like I could leave her in danger, right? So, later over dinner, I told my family about Blair's current situation. Oh, how terrible! Yes, Blair must come and stay. Yay! Their kindness didn't surprise me as my stepmom and stepsis, Chrissy, have been lovely to me ever since I moved in. You know what's even cooler? Christy is a rising teen pop star, but she's so sweet! We've grown super close, and she even told me all about her secret boyfriend, Damien. They'd been together long before Chrissy became famous, and had since kept their relationship out of the public eye. This is so exciting! I haven't seen Blair since our parents split! This guest bedroom is gonna be hers and we're living under one roof again! Blair's basically my alter ego. She's pretty, outgoing, and popular, while I'm more of a homebody. Come to think of it, I see a lot of Blair and Chrissy. They're both so extroverted and confident, they'll get along just great. But to everyone's surprise, Blair showed up looking completely different. Wow, it seems like living with mom, a party animal, had clearly influenced Blair. Hello, Blair. I'm Stacy, and this is my daughter Chrissy. Welcome to Portland. You must be tired from your trip. Let me take your bag. Sure. Huh? Doesn't it seem like everyone's excited about Blair's arrival, all except for Blair? Maybe she's just tired. I showed Blair her room and helped her unpack. Oh my god, they're unbearable. How can you stand living with them? They think they're so much better than everyone else. What? Blair had only spoken to them for five seconds. Why she disliked them so much already? Give them a chance, they're really lovely. Blair's probably just stressed out from all the mom stuff. 
Hopefully, with time, she'll see how great Stepmom and Chrissy are. Only, things didn't get any better. After class, both Chrissy and Blair came up to me. Hey, hey wanna, wanna hang, hang out? out? I asked her first. Oh, then we can all go together. Sorry, Chrissy. It's just that we haven't seen each other in ages, and there's a lot of catching up to do. Maybe we can go to Sephora tomorrow to check out that new Anastasia palette you like. Sure, have fun. Then Chrissy left. I'm sure she really wants us all to hang out. Oh, please. She thinks just because she's popular, she can always get her own way. She's mid. Okay, maybe it's best not to mention either of my sisters to one another to avoid World War III. Things went on like that for a while. I took turns to hang out with Blair and Chrissy. Once, when Blair was chilling in my room, I noticed her smiling at her phone. Seemed like our homegirl had finally found something fun to enjoy around here. I excitedly asked her what she was watching. Look, isn't he cute? He goes to our school also. Wait, no, it can't be. That's Damien, Chrissy's secret boyfriend. If Blair learns that the girl she hates is her crush's girlfriend, all hell will break loose. I think I'll ask him out. Really? He's so popular, he must have hundreds of girls wrapped around his finger already. Besides, what if he's not into you? You'll only be rejected and get hurt. What do you mean? Am I not pretty enough? Oh, I see. You think that a popular guy like him is only suitable for your famous, fabulous other sister, Chrissy, don't you? No, no, that's not what I mean. You're gorgeous. In fact, out of his league. You deserve a guy who has time just for you. So why bother competing for attention from someone like him? Okay, thanks. But he's my type. I'll ask for his number Monday morning. Oh no, I just accidentally encouraged Blair to ask out Chrissy's boyfriend. I can't reveal that Chrissy and Damien are secretly together, but I can't let Blair steal someone else's boyfriend either. What a mess. I tossed and turned all night. Then when I woke up, I decided I'd just have to make Blair stop liking Damien. I don't condone catfishing, but right now it's the only way. Hey there, Blair, right? It's Damien here from math class. What you doing? A few seconds later, Blair replied, Oh my god, I was just thinking about getting your number. Looks like the first steps of my plan are working. I texted Blair as Damien regularly. I made sure he was a man of a thousand red flags. But for some puzzling reason, Blair seemed smitten with him. I gave him a seriously challengeable temperament. He could throw a tantrum one moment and become sweet the next. Then I photoshopped Damien's selfie into a photo of a messy bedroom, then sent it to Blair. Surely she couldn't abide by a narcissistic, messy guy like him. I'm so sorry, Damien, but I have to save my family. Huh? What? She sent back a picture of her room being messier than ever. She's always the clean freak around here. I had to see with my own eyes. Hey, may I borrow your hair curler? And what's with your room? So what if it's a bit untidy? Neat people are total psychos. Okay, it's time to get personal. Blair's biggest pet peeve was being commented on her look. So when she sent Damien a selfie, I didn't hold back. Babe, can't you dress more ladylike? And you really should cover up that awful tattoo. Voila, that's how you wake up the beast inside this fierce girl. <laughs> However, the next day, Blair showed up with a completely new look. Worse still, she walked straight over to Damien. I had to fake having an emergency to prevent a disaster from happening. Afterward, I texted Blair. I'm not ready to let everyone know about us yet. Please understand, babe. You know I like you. There, that should stop her from trying to approach him again. Even so, during lunch, Blair wouldn't stop blabbering about Damien and showing me his text. Isn't he quite rude? You don't normally let guys tell you what to do. He's not. He's just opinionated. I'm into that. No, he's horrible. I don't understand why you like him. He's sweet. You just don't know him like I do. Our love is complicated, but that's what makes it special. Seriously, you called that love? What do you know? Okay, little Miss Love Guru. If you're really that experienced, make that guy your boyfriend. Succeed, and I'll give up the love of my life. If not, I'll do as I please. What Blair is daring me to do was impossible. That guy, Adrian, is as popular as Damien. While Damien's the friendly one, Adrian is nicknamed Jack Frost due to his icy cold exterior. Rumor has it, no one has ever seen him crack a smile. Surrender, as expected. Then step aside, sister. Not knowing what else to do, I agreed to the bet. This is for Blair, for Chrissy, for dad's happiness. Hi, Adrian, right? I, I I'm, uh, are you free tonight? Or whenever. He gave me this cold glance, then went back to chatting with Damien. Please, I'm just trying to win a bet with my sister. One smile from you is enough to save the fate of an entire family and stop two girls becoming homeless. Can you just... Adrian gave me this odd look. Then he burst out laughing and took my hand. Sure thing. Can't wait for our date tonight. I left in a haze of confusion. That 
really just happened? Adrian must be messing around. But nope, he actually showed up at my doorstep that evening. This meant I'd won the bet, right? So I called Blair over to show her, but she just brushed it off. That proves nothing. Talk to me when Ice Boy professes his love for you. Man, I guess this means I'm going on a date. The tension in here was palpable, so I decided to break the awkward silence. Hey, where are we going? I mean, this isn't actually a real date, is it? It's definitely real. You insisted. I must have looked so dazed that he continued. Don't worry, I'm not messing with you. Anyway, I think you'll like where I'm taking you. I used to think he was incapable of smiling, but turns out he looks even cuter when he does. A drive for a cinema? Wow! I'd seen these in old movies, but I had no idea it still existed. So, what's the deal with your sister Chrissy? You mentioned the bet? You know that Chrissy is my sister? Of course, it's not exactly hidden. Besides, I'm friends with Chrissy's boyfriend. So, you know? Yep, there's no secrets between me and Damien. And don't worry, I have his back. So, can you answer my question now? <laughs> I like this different side to Adrian. So before I could stop myself, I told him how the bet wasn't with Chrissy, but with my other sister, Blair. And I was catfishing Blair as Damien to protect my family, but it's barely working. Whoa, that's intense. Secrets make things complicated. Life sure would be easier if we could just be ourselves. So, why did you decide to go on a date with me? Don't you think it's weird? No, not really. Beats how girls normally ask me out. I arrived home feeling on cloud nine, but then I walked past Chrissy's room and saw her upset. I asked her what's going on. It's Damien. He wants us to go public, but I told him I'm not ready yet. I like having this part of me private, and I don't want Damien to be open to backlash and scrutiny. But he didn't understand and thought I was embarrassed of him. Oh, Chrissy, what a pain. Give him time, I'm sure he'll come around. But the school performance is in a few days. How am I supposed to take the stage in this state? I hated seeing Chrissy so downhearted like this. And I thought about Adrian and what he said during our date about honesty. I don't know much about the pressures of fame, but I do know that your feelings for Damien are real. I don't think love is something that you should hide. Honesty is the best policy. It might be hard at first, but you can get through it together. Now, come to my case, I should also follow my own advice and put an end to my catfishing before it gets out of hand. I tried hard to think of the best way to break this to Blair while we were walking to school the next day. After much hesitation, I pulled her aside before entering school for a talk. Only, before I could get to the main part, Damien walked past and oddly, Blair didn't do so much as to blink. Seeing my confusion, she said, Yesterday, he ignored all of my messages. You're right, I deserve someone better. Anyway, what did you want to tell me? Oh, that, um, my date with Adrian was amazing. It all happened because of you, so thanks. And sorry about Damien. It's okay. That's strange. Did my smitten sister really just give up that easily? But anyway, at least it's all over now. <sighs> and I don't even have to come clean anymore. The day of Percy's performance arrived. Me, Adrian, and Damien had backstage access. Actually, I'm here for emotional support as Chrissy is about to tell everyone about her relationship with Damien. This is a surprise for Damien too. He just thinks we're here to get a better view of Chrissy. <laughs> she slays the performance and the audience adored her. Thanks everyone, thank you so much. Actually, today is an extra special day because I have something. But suddenly Blair stormed onto the stage and snatched Chrissy's mic. How about making it even more special with this breaking news? Everyone, she's had a secret boyfriend all this time. She made the poor guy hide in the shadow so she can keep her squeaky clean image. She's lied to you all for years. Is someone like that worthy of your support? Blair ran off as soon as she finished. Boos start coming from the crowd. Many people began commenting on the situation in true TMZ fashion. What is this, 2009 VMA? No way, my Chrissy is taken? Meanwhile, Chrissy had a panic attack and froze there on the stage. I didn't know what to do. Neither did Damien. Luckily, Adrian kept calm and grabbed the walkie-talkie, connected to Chrissy's in-ear. Chrissy, listen to me. In times like these, there's only one way out, and that's confronting the truth and taking back the narrative. I looked at Adrian and realized something about my own problem. More on that later. For now, let's see how Chrissy handles this. Well, there goes my big reveal. Yes, I'm in a relationship but I only kept it quiet because I wanted to separate my personal life from my professional one. Being a public figure and a teenager at the same time is not as easy as you might think, so I didn't want to drag my loved one into that life too soon. On reflection, maybe this wasn't the best way to deal with this. 
I won't hide anything from my fans anymore, and those who truly support me won't judge or speak badly of my decision. Everyone, I want you to meet Damien, my boyfriend. The audience went wild! Aw, this is so cute! But I still had one more problem to deal with. Blair! I look everywhere and finally found her hiding under the bleaches. Blair, it's just me. Please come out. I started to talk about what just happened, but Blair didn't want to hear it. I know everything! You tricked me because you think I'm an idiot! La 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 la! I let her finish her outburst and calm down. Then I apologized and told her the truth. I only did it because I didn't want you going after a boy who's already taken. I know, I went about it in a completely wrong way. But I just wanted to keep our family together. I love you, and I don't want to be in the middle of your jealousy towards Chrissy anymore. If you just gave her a chance... You could have just been honest with me! This is all because you prefer Chrissy over me, don't you? No, of course not. I just wanted to protect you and for there to not be any more conflict between you and Chrissy. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Actually, I'm not jealous of Chrissy because she's famous and gorgeous. It's actually because you guys are really close. We used to be that close when our parents divorced and now it's like I've been replaced. Blair's honesty touched me in the feels. I gave her a big hug, but then realized that we weren't alone. Actually, I'm jealous of you, Blair. You're all Kieran and Eva talks about. And I feel that, even though we're close, I can't compete with her real sister. Oh, so the tension between them wasn't just over a boy. It was actually over me. To me, you're both my real sisters, and I love you dearly. Come on, sisterly cuddle. Oh, by the way, how did you know that I was pretending to be Damien? I overheard your conversation with Chrissy. It didn't take much digging around to figure out it was you texting me, not the real Damien. While we're at it, I find it worrying you were still into him after all those red flags. In future, please let me vet your dates first. You're too easily blinded by good looks. Oh dear, that's why us girls have to stick together, especially when it comes to boys.